Ladies and gentlemen, here we are at Real Deal Talk uh, with Cynthia Collins. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you are, I'm going to give you a couple quick bullet points on what we're going to hit on today because I, I, I met Cynthia, and you guys know how I do it. I'm letting the Holy Spirit bring people to me on the fly. And that's who's coming into the podcast. I'm like, you know what? This person, you're coming in, you're coming in. And the Cynthia is the epitome of this, okay? Because I started digging into a little bit of her backstory just uh, on the fly here. And just so you know, here's what we're, if you're like, number one, cancer survivor. Okay, so you, a loved one, someone in your family, this will be a very, very uh, kind of practical and, and great information for you to see how she did that, the, the practical steps and what, how she got through it. Uh, but also, this is this one blew my mind. Uh, Cynthia here, the sweet little Cynthia, look at her. Um, she, was in, she was in Compton, lived in Compton during the Watts riots. And for anybody that's watching this, uh, even the, what, 30s, they probably barely even know what that is, yeah. right? 40s and 50s. I you... mean, rap music made Compton famous. <clears throat> exactly. And Cynthia here lived in Compton during mm. that time. I mean, mm. that that alone, you're going to want to stick around and hear that story of how mm. she got through that. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, uh, she has uh, adopted, she and her husband. Yeah, we've been married 40 years. 40 years. Have mm -hmm. adopted three children. And we, and we have two bio children, too. And two bio children. Mm -hmm. And the reason the adoption thing's a big deal is because if you're out there and you're, you know, your infertility issues, whatever the case is, mm -hmm. you're trying, you're trying, you're trying, and you're like, I just don't know. Mm -hmm. Adoption's an option. Absolutely. So I'm going to tell that story. She's going to tell that story as well for that reason, for those that are, and I'll be quite frank with you, and this is the first time I'm ever even saying this out loud. My wife and I, we want a third so mm. bad, but we're in our 50s, mm -hmm. and we're actually thinking about adopting now. Mm -hmm. We are. I mean, because and if people are like, are you psychotic at 50 years old? Why would you do such a thing? Because like, we love it, yeah. and we're good at it. And we want to raise another human. We're just, anyway, that's another oh, story. I love it. I, I, that's the first time I've mentioned this to anybody, let, mm. let alone on a podcast uh, mm. publicly. So here we go. All right. So Cynthia Collins. So we met, Cynthia and I met, she was referred to us for, referred to me for a bed, right? And who were you referred by? I'm was, not really sure, but it was Labor Day weekend in 2020. Yeah. And you had to make appointments only to get into the door, <laughs> yeah. which is crazy. I have to make an appointment to see a bed. <laughs> Um, and, and it was one of the last minute decisions. I mean, we, as part of a Facebook group of breast cancer survivors who decided to go flat, no reconstruction, that's specifically my angle on things, the holistic and healthy option. Um, I felt compelled that I needed a bed that was adjustable. And a split came because every time my husband moved, it would move me. Right. And so that sounds so painful. That just sounds so painful. So I just all of a sudden just said, I have to have the, I have to have an adjustable bed. And I really, I don't really remember how I got here, but I got here somehow. Right. Yeah. And I laying on the bed and I'm going, okay, give me the best bed we have here. <laughs> and you gave me the Cadillac. Oh yeah. So, um, and, and, and I need it delivered because my surgery's in a week. And I need it delivered and set up so I know I come home to this bed. And that's how you bid. And you had it done. This, it came Saturday. It was tight. It was Saturday and my surgery was Monday morning. But it was done. It, and it was wonderful. And it's a split king. So it doesn't, it was really helpful and not feeling any pain from movement from yeah. your um, husband moving around and tossing and turning or whatever. So it was great. And I, and I didn't plan on doing a commercial for Real Deal Sleep, by the way. But, but I did. But, but I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. I did. <laughs> and and I remember your situation so vividly. Mm. And, and of course, because your, your name is the same as my mom's name, Cynthia. Oh, wow. So something, I had a connection immediately. I got to make this happen somehow, mm. some way. I'm like, there's going to be a miracle to get it to you that fast. Mm. But this is a major cause. You did say that. Yes. Yeah, so this is good. But there's a cause here that I got to make this happen. Because this th it was very simple for me, by the way. Because when you're open-minded and you need something great, then one of my natural latex beds is the most one that you're like floating in a cloud. So there's no pressure, meaning on your body. So mm. it was e very easy for me to match you up with the correct one, by the way. So it was a pleasure, mm -hmm. by the way. And I'm so happy to hear mm -hmm. that it made a big difference in mm -hmm. your recovery and your life. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> so now that we've gotten the Real Deal Sleep commercial out of the way. <laughs> oh, we'll do a plug on our store. We have Collins Family Jewelers. And, Collins Family Jewelers. And we've owned it for over 43 years. That's it'll be, right. It'll be 44 years in October. So I've, 
I feel my plug is I do believe we are the oldest family owned and operated retail store in San Diego, Imperial County. It, Most people hire out after yeah. a certain point and it, our kids all work there. And where's your store? In Mira Mesa, in the shopping center across from Target. I completely forgot about mm-hmm. that. I'm so glad that you brought that up. Yep. Beautiful. So yeah. we'll hit again. We'll hit on that again, and we'll yeah. put in all your yeah. all your bios and everything. Yeah, I love that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Cynthia, let's go back to let's give me a brush up on childhood. Like, how did you get here? When did you get here? What's the story? How oh, did you How did you end up in Compton? I know it was a beautiful Leave It to Beaver neighborhood back in the fifties. There's no doubt. And, and may I ask, how old are you? Uh, we'll be sixty three. Wow, you yeah. look fantastic. Yeah. You look like thank a million you. bucks. Oh, thank you. Moisturize, moisturize, moisturize. I know, it's my wife's ass. Yes. Um, you know, so my dad, both my parents were born in China. And at the time, I'm serious, it was a beautiful neighborhood, beautiful neighborhood. Um, but it was um, predominantly um, Caucasian neighborhood. And if you were off Santa Fe um, Avenue, which is where the railroad tracks went through, you lived on one side of the track if you were one um, ethnicity, and then maybe on the other side wasn't allowed to cross that railroad track. Mm. Oh, really? Right. And this is back, back whenever. Um, so we, my dad worked so hard, and he bought his first home in Compton. And it was a beautiful neighborhood, like I said. And when did you get, were you were you born in the States? I was born there. Mm-hmm. You I were. was born in Linwood, which is a city <clears throat> next to Compton yeah. at St. Francis Hospital. Got it. Um, everyone kind of knows about that. It's a Catholic hospital. Um, and and all seven of my brother, six brothers and sisters are seven of us that um, wow. were, that lived there. And it was this little three bedroom, one bath house. Oh, well. Let me tell you. With, 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 do you say seven siblings? Six siblings, seven of us all together. <laughs> lived in this little house with one bathroom with a shower and tub. One bathroom? So I learned Yikes. really fast that you need to take your shower first so that there's hot water in the water heater. Yeah. And then, so that was my lesson on taking showers first. But the, the, it was a beautiful house, beautiful, beautiful backyard. I love my backyard. My dad and my mom. Um, you know, had it always nice and manicured and there was a vegetable garden. So we saved a lot of money by growing our own vegetables and eating, um, you know, organically pretty much yeah. at the time. Um, but at the, t- at the time when I was growing up, I really, I, and I say this again, I had a really colorblind childhood. Yeah. I had no idea I was Chinese until the Watts riots. Really? It was kind of like Adam and Eve. They didn't know they were naked until they ate the apple. And it was so sad because everything was going along, do, 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 really well. And then all of a sudden, boink, you're this, you're that, you're this, you're that. And you, we don't get along anymore. So your peers started like... Making fun of me. Making fun of you. Mm-hmm. And what age was that, do you know? Do you I guess I fourth grade, fourth, fourth fifth grade. grade. So mm-hmm. you went that long? Without being made fun of, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wow. Now in your school, was, there, was it integrated in your school from day one? Like kindergarten, first grade? Okay, so I went to kindergarten across the street because our Catholic school didn't have a kindergarten. And it was obviously somewhat integrated. But um, we went to a Catholic school where there were 50 kids in my first grade class. 50. And there were two classes of 50 kids. And they were taught by nuns. And again, we learned how they didn't have AIDS. They all had order. We were all, I think I can visualize it actually in my first grade class. Um, You know, five rows of 20 or yeah. 20 rows. It just seemed like there was like long rows of kids all in one wooden desk after another. Um, and actually, I, I have reconnected with my first grade teacher. She is absolutely one of my favorite teachers no of my way. life. She lives up in um, Orange County. Mm-hmm. No kidding. Not a nun anymore, but still a fabulous woman. And at the time, I, I think I just thought everyone either had, you know, darker skin, lighter skin, green eyes. There was a lot of Creole um, children that had green eyes. Obviously, French Creole is how, part black, part French. Yeah. Um, wavy hair, smooth hair, kinky hair, black hair, blonde hair, red hair, freckles. There were black people with freckles. I mean, I just never thought anything about even myself. I didn't. I had really long hair and bangs. My mom, you know, t- took really good care of my hair, so I had really super long hair, and everyone loved my hair. Oh. Um, I don't have that anymore, but that's okay. That's another story. Um, but that. But the thing about it is how wonderful it is to have had a colorblind childhood growing up developmentally. Mm. It's talk, really talking about that. Yeah, it's really, really, you know, um, 
there was actually these twins we my best friend and I we had a crush on and um they were you know they were a light black and we were just like so enamored with them and it's just it didn't matter you didn't say oh I like him because he's black you like him because he's darn cute yeah you know that is the bottom line um and 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 you got I got a lot of respect for being smart Hmm. which is mm, inherently someone might say is a stereotype of Asians, <laughs> but I earned it. Oh my gosh. I worked so hard. Um, and I was um, maybe second in class and there was one Latino girl and I didn't know she was Mexican at all. Yeah. Her last name was Salazar and she was the top student yeah. in my class. She was my nemesis. Your nemesis. I could not keep up with her. She was amazingly wow. brilliant. And then she left. So eventually a lot of people left because they went to Orange County. Yeah. When the Watts rights hit, everyone who had any so resources left. They moved yeah. away. Yep. They did not stick around to see what was going to happen. Wow. Um, and it, and I just, I saw that my dad kept saying, I'm going to move. I'm going to move. I'm going to move. I go, daddy, why didn't you move? Oh, too hard, too hard. You know, he's already working two to three jobs for yeah. heaven's sakes. Yeah. And so I, I felt I could never complain because I could see how hard he was working. Yeah. There's no way I can complain and say, daddy, why are you doing more? Why don't you do more? And he it just wasn't fair. So I I started working very young. All of us um, of the four older kids, we all started working as soon as we turned fourteen. We all had jobs. And so this was the, so the Watts riots were starting now. Uh, they were already started. Already, yeah, already so, had happened. So do mm -hmm. me a favor, sum up the Watts riots for those that are watching that have either heard about or have no idea what you're talking about. What happened? How did it start? What was going on? I'm not really sure what how it happened. I mean, if you Google anything, everything's distorted and yeah. facts are not what they were. I mean, you know, I can only tell you as a child's witness on what happened that the neighborhoods literally died. Our neighborhood literally died. And everyone all of a sudden had bars on their windows and German shepherds um, in their backyards that were not friendly dogs, believe me. You, you definitely ran when you saw one get out of the gate. Um, I mean... Martin Luther King was a huge role model. His music, you know, um, that were supporting him. And then, of course, when he got murdered, it was a very devastating thing. I think it's devastating when anyone gets murdered, yeah, honestly. Yeah. Whatever person gets murdered horrifically. Um, I did have the opportunity of going to public school for the summer. So I went to classes there, and that's how I got to know the neighborhood kids. Yeah. Um, and they all looked up to me because <clears throat> at that time... Uh, our Catholic school definitely academically was higher than uh, public school. But I also had a one single Japanese girlfriend that lived down the street until she moved to Orange County also. Um, and we were never messed with, but they seriously did not know what I was. I was walking home one day and they have the original McDonald's and the original pick and save there. And I was walking home and this one little black boy goes, hey, Mexican lady, hey, Mexican lady. And I go, I'm not Mexican, I'm Chinese. And he looked at me and like, what in the heck is that? And so I realized <laughs> that a lot of people just didn't know what we were. And so they left us alone. Like we were neutral zone. We weren't white and we weren't black yeah. and we weren't Latino. We were just something else. And so I never felt afraid, but let alone that what was happening was the Crips and the Pyros were starting to come in. The gang activity was definitely moving in. Oh, everything changed everything like you know people's cars got broken into yeah. houses got broken into we didn't get broken into close of the towards the end when we actually left and someone totally just you know decimated our house there was everything was opened and turned upside down wow but my mom let me walk home from the school bus stop on Long Beach Boulevard I went I took the bus all the way to Long Beach to go to a Catholic high school and I was told I was told that you can walk home from school to get home. A single girl. Wow. A teenage girl. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. And and the guys would come riding alongside and say, hey, babe, hey, babe. You know, yeah. I'm like, please don't. And I actually started figuring it out. I just looked at them and said, hi. And so disarming them with a friendly smile is not what they expect. Yeah. You, don't, you just, I started building that that Teflon coat that you can't mess with me. Don't mess with me. Don't mess with me. Yeah. Maybe I started thinking, maybe I know karate. If I could tell him I know karate, but I don't know karate. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> but those are things that you have to figure it out. And I asked my mom, I said, mommy, what did you, why did you think it was okay for me to walk home? She, you know, this is not that long ago. I asked her that. And she said, oh, I knew you could take care of yourself. Wow. Wow. But today, would you let your daughter walk no. home? Not even in San Diego. Yeah, would you let the them mailbox? Yeah, not even to the mailbox. You would say no to your 14, 15, 16 year old <laughs> girl. You would never no. let them walk. And I never inside of me wasn't whether did my mom and dad love me enough to not pick me up from the bus stop or drop me off at the bus stop or whatever. It, I don't know. I just never really got a victimized 
mentality ever. That's, that's incredible. Yeah, I never I mean, did. it really is. It's mm-hmm. incredible to hear this mm-hmm. because it's like, and you couldn't have been in a worse mm-hmm. neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you just, because of the confidence you had, mm-hmm. they didn't mess with you. Mm-hmm. What did they do? They just leave you like, oh, okay, take care. Mm-hmm. They just, yeah. and every day you, you walk the same path. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Did the same guys come by every day? No. It was no. different people different, that yeah. would stop or yeah. whatever. But, uh, you know, I I think that <clears throat> at now looking back in retrospect, I do believe I had a halo of protection around me. Yeah. And I, I didn't know, but I was always on the spiritual side. Even though I went to Catholic school, I was more of a charismatic Christian, even in high school, yeah. which none of my family members are. They never were. And my mom was very afraid of charismatic Christians. Very afraid. Really? Oh yeah. My go- my brother's godmother was charismatic Christian, and and it, explain that term. A charismatic Christian with people who speak in tongues. Ah, yeah, uh-huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Knott's Berry Farm used to have uh, charismatic nights where yeah. you would listen to Christian music and pray in tongues and pray out loud. Raise your hand up. Raise your arms in praise. Yeah. Ooh, no, not in a Catholic church. You don't do that. No, no, no. You no. sit and kneel, and that's it. Yeah, and sit and kneel and sit and, and, kneel, and, kneel. and sit and kneel. Yeah, yeah. Over and memorize and, and say the same words and repeat yeah. the same words every time. Yeah. So I, uh, I went to Loyola Marymount. I worked. I, I figured that my dad was not going to move. I had to take it upon myself. I have to get myself out of Compton. So early on in my high school, actually eighth grade, I kind of kind of vividly remember, I am going to be, I've got to be the perfect student. I have to have the perfect resume. I have to get scholarships. I have to make enough money. I have to work every minute I have and save every penny I have so I can get out of here and go to the college that I want to go to and go away yeah. and live away yep. from home. I had three little sisters that are seven, eight, nine years younger than me. I never gave myself permission to be naughty because I felt I was their role model. And same with my brothers, actually. I'm only, and I say this because it's kind of it's kind of strange because I've never met anyone else. I'm only 10 months younger than my older brother. Wow. And then I have a severely handicapped brother who's 13 months younger than me that was born with spina bifida mm. and multiple birth defects. He was born without his gross muscles. He looks like skin and bones. Um, he came out in a fetal position and had to have multiple surgeries to open up his hinges just so he could walk, which he did at maybe five years old yeah. and with braces. And I was his partner in crime. I would hide his braces when he went to Children's Hospital um, to go do surgery, therapy. I mean, the guy went through so many surgeries uh, that I can't even tell you. I now look back with my one double mastectomy and think, oh my gosh, as a little boy, he was left alone in this hospital with my mom couldn't stay with him because she's got kids at home. Yep. And so that that developed a lot of empathy mm, in me as wow. his older sister. Wow. And then I had another brother um, 15 months after him and he had um, asthma. <laughs> and then wow. my mom took a break and then she had... Three girls, seven, eight, nine years younger. No me. kidding. Three every year. So three are years you kind of right in the middle then? Or are you at the top? Second oldest. You're second. Wow. Mm-hmm. But I was more like an, the oldest kid kind of a thing. I I definitely took my responsibility seriously. I and, was not a, re- a rebel at all. So do me a favor. Hit on the topic here because you, you touched on it and I want to hit on it again real mm-hmm. quick. You had said you had a colorless childhood mm-hmm. because this is the color star. Blind. Colorblind. Mm-hmm. Because colorblind childhood. Mm-hmm. And what that means is Back in the day, we didn't see Mm -mm. colors much because Mm -mm. now what's happening this day and age is the complete opposite. It's almost like they're shoving it down our throat to be, uh, you know what I mean? I know. Like But how can you? Because they're just like, uh, now it's like they want to divide us. There's no pure race. So I don't even understand how people, I mean, today in San Diego, we see it more than ever. There's like all kinds of different relationships. Yeah, everything. Um, You know, I taught our core as a volunteer for many years. And one of the first lessons we teach is tint and um, and saturation. So you have white paint on one side and black paint on the other. And you add just a touch of white to the black, which makes it gray. And you touch a very light touch of black into the white and it makes it gray also. Hmm. I mean, it just depends if you want to add more black or more white. It makes it lighter and lighter, darker, darker. Um, And I realize now that unless you are like white paint or like black paint, you're always going to be a, a, a mix of white and black, no yeah. matter what. We are not pure white and not pure black. And so even with myself, with our children that are half and half, they're half Chinese. I in, in Hawaii, they call them hapas, yeah. you know, and half Chinese and half Irish German mutt. And people would go to my kids all the time and say, what are you? 
Yeah. They're like, she's all exotic. You know, what are you? And I taught my kids because they told me they pe- people would ask them that. Yeah. And I said, well, tell them your mom is Chinese and your dad is an Irish German mutt. And end of story. Just answer the question and then move on to the next topic of conversation. And so it taught us early on how to deal with that. So we go back. To, we've been married 40 years in February. And on my wedding day, my dad was crying. And I'm in my wedding dress. And I said, Daddy, why are you crying? And at that time, he felt that all white guys get divorced. <laughs> and at the That's time... That's why he was crying. He was crying. <laughs> you can always come home. Don't worry. If things don't work out, you can... I go, Dad, I love your vote of confidence here. What's wrong with you? <laughs> I'm going to just have to prove you wrong and stay married for lots and lots of years. Yeah. Um, but he, we, at the time, we did have two relatives that went through divorce and their husbands were Caucasian. Yeah. So so then his mom comes from, they're from Southern Illinois. She was kind of like, ooh, you know, everyone's, I didn't even know the word gook at the time. They oh, said, God. oh my gosh, what is that? <laughs> I've never even heard that word before. And then people would say things and I, I just didn't know. I, I Like I said, I had a very um, beautiful childhood and life that I didn't, I was very ignorant about a lot of things, which is kind of good. It's kind of innocent. Yes, I yeah, love it. I, 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 I love my childhood knowing those kind of things happened to me because it could have been very hard. And that's where people feel victimized when you try to embrace things that people say to you and then you internalize it and you become victimized. And I don't. I never stopped myself that way. I did know that I was Chinese at some point and I loved my Chinese culture. So at, we would have international days at our school, which is predominantly black. And I would bring in, my mom would help me make egg roll and chow mein noodles. And I'd wear a Chinese outfit. None of my siblings did this. I was the only crazy one that would like this. And I just loved being Chinese. And I loved sharing that I was Chinese. I embraced it. Yeah. Now, I know relatives that said they hate being Chinese. They wish they were white. And I'm thinking, wow, that's crazy. Why you say that? Yeah. I think we have better food. So, <laughs> and it's, but it is, those are things that, you know, it depends on how you internalize what happens to you. Yeah. Things do happen, but it happens to everyone. Exactly. So how you handle it is the key. Exactly. That's mm-hmm. that's the moral of the story. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now, so you were at, you said Loyola? Yes, so okay. I focused, I have no idea, I don't even remember how I chose Loyola Marymount. I just said, I want to go to Loyola. So high school, you were like a top of the, f- right. top of- I was valedictorian. Valedictorian yep. high school. Yep, I had a 4.0 average at wow. the time, yeah. wow. And it I, was easy for you. Did no, you it was study? not easy. It wasn't. It wasn't. I you cried. had to study. Oh, I had. I cried all the time. I negotiated with teachers all the time. <laughs> if I if I was getting a A minus, I go, can I do extra credit, please? I know. Just because you got an A minus. Yeah. Because I, you, there's no prizes for you when you're second best. You have to be the top. Yeah. And I only beat out the other girl at it. Like, she was a three point nine eight. She partied in junior year and got an A minus in chemistry or something like that. And I wasn't good at chemistry, but I was great at communication with my chemistry professor, teacher. (laughs) And I said, you need to help me, please help me. And she did. She did. And those are people I won't forget. That's unreal. That's unreal. It was all part of God's plan, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't do it alone. But back then, it seemed like I was on my own to do this. Now, let me ask, how did you get into, like, I'm completely ignorant here. Don't, isn't there Buddha involved with Chinese or No. Buddha? Yeah, normal. Yeah, my grandmother was Buddhist. Yeah. I we had, we had a kind of a liberal kind of high school if you want to say so. We had a world world religions class. Yeah. And I, my grandmother had visions of Buddha and I would share that with the class as part of our world religions um, you know, whether you were studying Taoism or Hinduism or existentialism even, I mean philosophies. It was kind of interesting a brother taught that and he was one of the best teachers at our high school everyone loved him yeah. everyone loved him and he presented this class and it i would say but it just even though we were a catholic high school it really opened your mind to the different parts of the world yeah. and how they believed and how they got to this point and and what makes us all you know good people the goals are all similar be a good person yeah be a good person. It's very simple. Do the right thing. Yeah. Um, so I got a lot out of that class, actually. I love studying existentialism. I loved ex- every philosophy that I studied was really stuck in my mind. Right. But it didn't mean, didn't change me from wanting to be Catholic. I still wanted to be Catholic. I just really loved learning about the world and what other um, civilizations had studied. That So... so- that's how you got into Catholicism early on? Did no, you, did my your... mom, <laughs> that story. So my mom left China. Japanese were um, terrorizing the world and they were wanting to leave China to try to avoid being, um, 
you know, between communism in China and the Japanese invasion, her father moved to the Philippines and her, she was four years old and moved her mom and her, just the two of them, to the Philippines to open a business. And if you ask people, a lot of the Chinese people are business people in, yeah. in the Philippines right. and looked up and looked up. And then they went to Baguio, which is a beautiful city as well. Um, so when they got there, my mom's, my grandmother said to my mom, find the best school, the best school yep. in this area. And it was a Catholic school. Ah. My mom goes there. She converts to Catholicism. And she gets permission to convert her four brothers and sisters to Catholicism. Wow. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother never felt bad that she goes, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Or, you know, she should have stayed Buddhist. We also have ancestry worship in our family where you honor your ancestors. And there's always kind of like that wet bar. (laughs) There's always a little shrine (laughs) with a fruit to feed them. uh, To got, you know, your oranges, um, apples, you know, you try to present good things to tell them you're thinking of them because you know that you're counting on them kind of like Mulan's little movie that that part really kind of gave everyone an idea about the ancestors the I ancestors are back there hanging out for you if you want to call on them and I always kind of oh. felt my grandmother I was really really close to my I only had one grandparent I got to know my paternal grandparents were in China and my paternal grandfather died and he's buried in the Philippines. I never met any of my three grandparents uh, uh, of those, but my one grandma came from the Philippines and immigrated here. So, you know, she wasn't Catholic, but she would go, like we had First Holy Communion or a graduation or a mass. She would come and she would be so polite and sit and, you know, participate. Oh, that's nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so she respected being Catholic. I don't really understand how <clears throat> that works. I mean, yeah. you know, if you're a diet, my grandmother was worshiping Buddha every single morning. Of course, yeah. And did her worship every single morning with her yoga moves kind of a thing. Um, and so I respected Buddhism yeah. a lot. But if you read about Buddhism, it is a, a way of life Correct. versus a god. That's right. So it's good to, it's not, a, don't be afraid of it because it's not something that's And gonna, it's a very positive way of life. Exactly. It's a super positive, a you, peaceful way of life. Exactly. Yeah. Like be a good person, do the right thing. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, it's just like a way of living. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. fascinating. But yeah, so that's how we became Catholic, which yeah. at the time Chinese Catholics, so when I get to Loyola Marymount, I don't even know. Like I said, I have no idea. I just focused on Loyola Marymount and I got in and I had to figure out how to get the money to pay for my tuition, my room board. I lived on campus, my books. My parents did not pay for anything. Nothing. And as a matter of fact, uh, my dad's been gone four years. And right before that, we had a conversation at, I took him to go see Santa Clara and I said, isn't this a beautiful campus, daddy? And he goes, yeah. And then I sat there and I realized, I go, daddy, you never saw my, my school, huh? At Loyola. No. He was working two or three jobs. Yeah, he never came home. He never moved me in. He never moved me out. He never saw it. I don't even know how I moved myself in. I moved myself out. I have no idea. And wow. if I ever went home, I took a bus to go home. I didn't have a car on campus. And so it was kind of crazy. But I love being at Loyola Marymount. And thanks to Loyola Marymount, I went skiing, which no Chinese people skied at the time. And no <laughs> people from Compton skied at the time. My roommates took me to go ski. And they stuck me in a ski class. And my husband was in the ski class. Get out of here. We were 19. Mm-hmm. No way. So I met him February 3rd. So give me, give me the rundown. How, yeah, how, what, met him February 3rd. So skiing. you looked at him, you thought he was cute. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I said, okay, this is good. And, and was, he, was he looking at you? And He thought I he thought I, w- I had a kid or something. I forget what? what he said. He said he thought I was with a kid. But anyway, we quickly figured that one out. And then I could not get off the rope toe without sliding backwards. And he would be right behind me catching me. I would let, her, let go of the rope toe and I'd be sliding back down the hill where I came from. And he would pick me up out of the snow, pick me up out of the snow, pick me up. And then we went on the Miracle Mile. Somehow I was stupid <laughs> enough to get on Miracle Mile. And then he goes with me and I it was all powder because it had just blizzarded the day before yeah. and he would pick me up out of this deep snow pick me up out of this deep snow pick me up out of the, and I just was so admiring his patience because my parents didn't my dad did not have any patience right and my brothers didn't have any patience because it was generational and so I loved that and he had the most beautiful eyes I just uh. loved his eyes and so I met him February 3rd and requested a transfer to San Diego State March 15th because that's where he was going he was he already had a business he already had our store when we were 19, he, get owned, out of here. Yeah, he already had opened our store at 19 it, uh, in Mira up. Mesa, in the same shopping center. We've been there the whole time. The whole 43 years, we've been in the same shopping center. What 19-year-old has their own business? But 
I, at Loyola, I did you try to go. Be I, I tried to go out with Chinese Catholics because I tried to honor my mom, and I went out with like three different guys, and they're all too short. So <laughs> ah. that that was kind of hard, and they were all kind of different. And um, you're saying they're too short. Yeah, I'm saying they're too. How short. short were they? I would say they're five six, five seven. Okay. I mean, they were just too short for me. I couldn't <laughs> wear heels and walk out with them. And so I said, "Mommy, I I brought I met the next short thing. guys are not liking this <laughs> Chinese ahead. Catholic." Uh, I can't find one, but how about an Irish Catholic, huh? That, how's that work for you? And so she loved him from the very beginning because she saw that he your, was your hard. Your mom did. Yeah, she saw that he was a hardworking entrepreneur because her family was entrepreneurs. They were all, my grandmother was a businesswoman and her grandfather, I mean, it was, we, my mom, my mom had a bachelor's degree from the 50s in business. What, what woman has a bachelor's degree and let alone be in business? So I had a role model that was, you know, and she worked, you know, after she had four of us, she she found it fun to work at Bank of America to get away from four of us. So she was a businesswoman from the very beginning. Wow. And then she went after, after that, she went and got her teaching credential and taught kindergarten. And after having seven kids, you would think she would oh my run. my gosh. Yeah, you'd think she would run. Yeah. And she taught in Watts. In Watts? Yes. She taught in Watts. Her first Holy contracts, smoke. her contracts were in Watts. Yeah. My mom taught in Watts. And, and it was crazy. That was... You know, you think about this. This is crazy, right? Yeah. But yeah, so I met Bill, and um, he so was you like, met "This was on the ski slopes." Yeah. What 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 slopes were? It these? was called Gold Mine. Gold Mine. But now is uh, you know whatever. There's Bear Valley, I think, is what it is now. Is it like oh, was, this is up by Bear Mountain. It, it was up in yeah, up in Big, Big Bear. Bear? Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. And so I requested transfer to San Diego State, and at that time, San Diego so you State guys, wait a minute, anyone. get back to the ski slope here. Yeah. So you're on the slopes with him. He's picking you up. You yeah. can't believe his patience. Did you guys hang out that night? No, nope, he wanted to, and my roommates were so mad at him because it took me forever to get down the last run because I just was so weak from, you know, I just didn't have good upper, upper torso strength. <laughs> I just couldn't get up anymore. And so a ski patrol man had to come bring me Are down. Are you kidding me? Because I was stuck up there because I was so exhausted. And they were all the only car waiting in the parking lot, and they were cold, and they were mad. And Bill wanted to come over and he said, and they said, hey, he said, hey, maybe I can come visit you guys. And my roommate goes, no, we're going to be busy playing Parcheesi. Yeah. And I'm like, really? Parcheesi. You're so mean. Mean girl. Um, so I said, well, let me get his, let me, let me, let me get his phone number and his, his address. Okay. He's never going to see you again. Why are you bothering? And I go, you don't know. You don't know. And I gave him my address and phone number at, at Loyola. And then I. I took his and that phone number. What phone kind number. of phone number did you have at this point? Like a landline? Yeah, landline. Yeah. Yeah, landline. Yeah. Let, let me, I want to make sure the watch is, ah. like, this is pre-cell phone. Cell phone. Yeah. Pre, and, and snail mail. Yes. Snail mail. Yeah. So I wrote. No emails. No, no, no email. emails. No, 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 no. It's either snail mail or phone call. <laughs> oh my gosh. Not a landline. So I wrote him right away. Yeah. You wrote him? Yes. I was the. I so was, you got his address too? So what happened the next day, he went skiing again and he left in his pocket and my information was soggy. Oh my gosh. So me. if I didn't have my, so I'm telling you girls who are listening that you have to, you have to do things so you have no regrets. Don't be like at the end of the Titanic and Rose yeah. is like, oh, I wish I had done this. Yeah. Take the number. Yeah. Ask for the info. Yeah. And keep it. Don't lose it. Don't drop it down a toilet somewhere. You <laughs> must move on things because opportunities need to be taken when they come. They don't come back you, twice. You never know. You never know. Very rarely do opportunities come back twice identically. No. Mm. This is a perfect example. Perfect example that I was the creator of my destiny. And then all my friends and their family were like, Mary Cynthia, that was my Catholic name. Mary yeah. Cynthia, you're moving and leaving Loyola for a a boy? Why? You worked so hard to get there. You know, it's not going to work out. And you left your school. And so what? You how know? long How long after you met him? So wait a minute. So you got his information. Yeah. And I you, wrote him. So you didn't get a phone number. You just got an address? No. I got a phone number. I got a phone number and an address. Did you call? Yes. Did you did he, he talk I to him? I called him because okay. he obviously didn't have my phone number because it was soggy. Well, he's like, oh my God, I'm so glad you called. Yes. He did say that. He, he did. said, I'm glad so God. And he told me that he mushed up my phone number. Wow. How much value he gave to my phone number, I have no idea. But he, <laughs> he didn't because he got soggy. Uh, he didn't put it in a waterproof place. And so um, I wrote him and I called him and he came to see me two weeks later. And so I met him February 3rd. And I requested a transfer to San Diego State March 15th. <laughs> And at that time, San Diego State took anyone that walked. So I got in with no problem. And I left Loyola and went to San Diego State. So he was going to state? 
No, he had the business already. Oh, he had the business already. Yes, he was working five days a week. Wow. He was working maybe seven days a week, actually, at, at the store with his mom and dad and his brother. Um, and I actually worked at the store for a little while during college when um, he needed some help because it was just a small so shop. So he went to San Diego State. Did you move in together immediately? No. No. No, I had a. oh, I had to go find... I've never been to San Diego. I had no friends or family here. I figured out how to get a room, how to get a roommate, how to get a car and drive this big city. And I was constantly getting lost. 805 South was always 805 North yeah, to me. How about Mission Valley? Yeah, I mean, that nightmare. area. I, I don't understand the logic of what they did with those on-ramps and off-ramps. It just didn't make sense. It still doesn't make sense today. <laughs> to me, to this day. To this day, it makes I, no I, sense. I literally never not get lost in Mission Valley, Yeah, ever. it's awful. It's terrible. Yeah, so I lived off Adobe Falls <laughs> and right near San Diego State, but I didn't live on campus. Yeah. I was a junior already, yeah. so that you couldn't live on campus. You had to live off campus. So I had to figure out how to get a place, figure out how to get a job, how to fit. I paid for this all on my own. Um, I sold shoes. I worked for Tom McCann's. So I was a salesperson from the get-go. Um, I worked at a pharmacy because I was pre-pharmacy when I was going to Loyola. So I was a bio major there. But then when I switched to San Diego State, I just changed my whole major to journalism with an emphasis on advertising. So I did a left brain, right brain thing. Yeah. And loved wow. it. Loved wow. my And I finished it in two years. A whole new major. Wow. In two years. Undergrad and, up, and upper grad, uh, upper division. Mm -hmm. And so when did you start getting into any type of career or... I tried. Yeah. I was turned. I was told that I was overqualified. I I worked for Fry and Smith, which is a large printing company that handled SeaWorld, Jack in the Box, and I always wanted to be a customer service rep. I wanted to be a CSR, and they turned me down. Huh. I think it's because I wasn't a blonde, blue-eyed person. Uh -huh. So I didn't fit what their image was. Yeah. And I was stuck sitting at a computer inputting estimates for eight hours Ugh. a day. Ugh. That was really annoying. Yucks. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah. But, you know, it was a job. It was right. a good job, right. actually. And and they did give us a great honeymoon gift. They gave us a snowmobile trip in in, um, in Wyoming to wow. see where Old Faithful was. It was great. So, but, how, so how long after you came down here did you guys get married? Yes. So we got married. We did break up for one month. And I strongly recommend that people break, break up for one month because people don't value you until Why you Why did you break up? Uh, you know, it's an interesting thing. I think I heard it at service this past Sunday that, what, what did that pastor say? You have a choice between something and something. You have to choose, what was it that he said? I he, wasn't there. I didn't hear it. He said something about choosing one or the other choice. And at the time I said, oh, you need to choose your mom or me. Cause he was, he was, uh. one, he was the first boy after five girls. He had nine in his family. He has seven sisters and one brother. And he was the first boy the prince after five girls and, wow. he, and he has the greatest personality so of course his mom adored him right yeah but he was definitely a you know a prince and yeah. and i said to him at the time you know um you need to choose me or your mom and he chose his mom at the time so we broke up for a month a month and then he realized it was a mistake and he be begged to get back yeah he admits it he begged to get yeah. back and i was hurt i was really really hurt I think that was the skinniest I ever was. I lost so much weight because I was so sad. Yeah. And when we got back together, we laid out the ground rules and we got married a year later. Wow. So we were only 22 and a half. We got married when we were married. Okay, so get into the ground rules because uh, I'm mm. big on having what I call the talk prior to locking in. Mm. I preach about it a lot. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by ground rules? <clears throat> One, of course, like I said, I was the most important person in his life. Yep. At the time, we were Catholic, but he actually was not going to church, and I was really strongly Catholic. But because he didn't go and his family didn't go, they were all raised Catholic. But when they got the store, they stopped going to church um, for various reasons. And I said, no one's ever going to make me stop going to church ever again. So if you can come along with me to church or not, but I'm going to go to church. And he says, well, you know, I'm take it easy, take it slow, but I'm going to go. And he did. Yeah. And that is pivotal in any relationship. I saw that's what was one of the dividing factors in my parents, that they did not have a spiritual unity. And I think any mm. any couple, well, one of the guys, when I went, first went out at Loyola Marymount, was a Russian Jew. Yeah. And I, what are you doing at a Jesuit Catholic university? And he goes, well, it's one of the best you know schools out there for what I did. And I go, well, I don't know about that, but I, there's why would you come here to be, you know, if you're not going to be Catholic. And and at the time I was a lector. So I, I was very active in yeah. yep. in doing liturgy. But, um, you know, it, it, people 
fall away from the church. They don't want to wake up in the morning. It all starts off like, I want to sleep in on Sunday because I work so hard. Yeah. Sounds normal, but it isn't normal because obviously the sacrifice we give to God is nothing what Jesus did to sacrifice for us. So right. to get up early at 730, we would go to 7 a.m. Mass when we first started. Why can't we go to nine? I go, because I don't do nine. I do seven. So, yeah. he, so he did. He started, He went to Mass with me after that. Mm-hmm. Any other ground rules? Uh, that you remember? No, not we. We we are super. What about the What about the plan? Like the store, the business? Like okay, here's what we're gonna do. So yeah, so that was an, an important time. Yes, yeah. you're right. That was a very critical time where I worked for Charlotte Russe. I don't know if everyone remembers Charlotte Russe oh, clothing yeah. store. I was assistant manager, and they told me that I had taken from the deposit and demoted me. Su- uh, subjected me to a lie detector test. Are you serious? Yes. At Charlotte Roos? Mm-hmm. Oh, come on. And that was the most demeaning thing that could have happened at that time to me. You know, someone who has high standards that you thought that I stole from there, from the deposit. Yeah. And I woke up one morning and I said, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to sell real estate. And my husband says, I okay, go back to sleep. And I said, and I was like so fired up. And so I went to our local Century 21 office, went in and I had a great broker who taught me everything. I have like one of those mm, kind of memories when you teach me something, I usually can remember what you tell me. And um, I ended up being like the top, one of the top agents in San Diego at the time. I was wow. only 28 at the time. When I got to that point, I was one of the top 30. And then um, when you got Centurion status is when you did 5 million. And I did that at 28 back how long ago? Wow. Super long ago. Yeah. 5 million? Today, of course not. Yeah. But today, it's all relevant to the of times. Course, yeah. And um, it was definitely the first year I made $10,000. Um, and at Charlotte Russe, when I was working full time, standing on my feet every day, killer feet, um, I made 9500 So I was so excited that I could have a flexible schedule, not stand on my feet for eight hours a day and make 10000 How's and, that? And think about these numbers right yeah, now. Think about that. We owned a home. My husband was a big believer in owning a home. He owned our first home. Oh, so this is how I got into real estate, actually. Um, he had four loans. It was creative financing time. No one wow. remembers. If you don't remember, here's a quick blast of the past. Interest rates went up to 18% to 20%. 18 to 20%? Yep. Um, and this is in <sighs> 1981. And creative financing is an owner carry back part of the loan. Um, agent carried back some of the loan. And you assume the first, and then you put in your down payment. Well, wow. at some point, one of the notes had a balloon payment. It was due and it was like, I don't know, $8,000. I didn't have $8,000. None of us had $8,000. Right. So I said, we have to sell our house, but there was not enough equity. So we went with help you sell. And so I learned how to sell our house. And that's when it came upon me, the aha moment. Ah, I can do this yeah. for a living. Because I really liked it. I yeah. really did. And I went and took my license test. So I was finished. I, couldn't, I was one of the first people to be finished with my, my real estate test. And I got my right, results right away and it started selling. And then I got pregnant. Mm. So I sold my whole first year pregnant with our oldest daughter. No way. I, and I only drove a Honda Civic hatchback with a five speed with no air conditioning. And I sold real estate. Oh my God. So don't tell me you need a Mercedes or a BMW to sell real estate. I sold <laughs> pregnant with a Honda Civic hatchback five suite with no air conditioning. With 18 to 20% interest, interest rates. rates. So <laughs> luckily the rates started to drop to 14. Drop to 14. <laughs> Listen to these numbers. They're 14 insane. and 13. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is great. So we sold our house and we bought another house, a fixer upper, our first fixer upper that we bought. It was gross. You know, there was like urine stains everywhere and the carpet and everywhere it was and oh motor oil there was motor oil stains in the living room i think he had a motorcycle at one point in the in the living room wow and we got an adjustable loan from home savings the start rate was 11 and a half percent wow what a bargain instead of getting a fixed rate of 13 wow wow what a bargain right time and people are going how do you know it's not going to go up how do you know i go well would you rather go ahead and get a 13 and a half go ahead i mean well, 
it continued to drop 11 and a half, 11, 10 and a half, 10. And all my clients, because I had done it, I was able to sell homes to people that could not have qualified with an adjustable loan. All the old people in my office, I mean, I was just this youngster, you know, 24 years old. And they were like, what? How? I don't understand it. You know, they, they just, it was a paradigm. Everyone got a fixed rate. I'm always about breaking paradigms. Yeah. And so I said, well, I got it myself. So I was my own guinea pig. And I knew exactly what loan. I said, get a 40-year term. You're not going to live here for 40 years, right? right? No, it was just a stepping stone. Get it where your payment's the lowest and get an adjustable loan so you can get in there. And in three years, you move up and you can take the equity and buy another home, which almost all of my clients did. Yeah. Almost all of them did. They were grateful because they were into like a 10.5% at some point, 10%. And no one would have dreamed of that when the interest rates are 13 and a half. So you have to be willing to be a risk taker. My husband was a risk taker. Obviously, he started our business. It was a coin and stamp collecting store. Wow. It was not a jewelry store. It was a coin and stamp collecting store. Who collects coins and stamps and makes a living off that? I don't know. My husband did. He had a, at 19, he had a coin auction company, a stamp auction, international coin and stamp auction companies that we would hold down in Mission Valley at one of those places. It was amazing. It was amazing to watch my husband do what he did. He knew everything about American coins and, and American stamps. It was crazy. And then came Pong. All the electronic games came up uh, and all the kids stopped collecting. No kidding. They killed the industry of coin and stamp collecting. What? And so he diversified. He started doing jewelry repairs, a little bit of like soldering chains and um, selling charms by weight. And he started doing like Tupperware parties for jewelry. We would go yeah. bring out jewelry to someone you know. Of course, you wouldn't want to go to a stranger's yeah. house. And he and my my cla- my classmates, you know, they were from pretty wealthy families from Loyola, and um, they would we would have gold parties, and we would sell you know gold by the weight. He'd have a weight a uh, scale and weigh everything and sell it by gram, yeah. and people like loved it because it's so. Like you can tell there's no markup. You knew you knew what the weight was. You know, you could we didn't Google at that time, but people right. kind of knew what yeah. the weight of gold was and the cost per gram. And he did he started selling an unconventional way of selling jewelry by weight. And now we don't do that, but it's just at the time we did it for actually several years where we weighed everything by the fluctuating in price of gold. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And so Eh, I digress. But th- those are all things. I mean, this is all happening. We're 19 and 20 and 21 years old. And Bill buys his first home at 20, 21 years old without wow. my recommendations. But he did it on his own. And he bought a home and we had to sell it out of sheer necessity. And then we bought our first home that was a fixer upper. And then we started building equity and, and moving up into other homes every every year. Our oldest daughter had a birthday in a different house every really? year for five years. Wow. We kept moving up until we were in Mira Mesa. So when we got to the top of Mira Mesa, we were the highest selling house. And the appraiser says, we cannot give you more value than because there's no other house that sold for this price. So we knew we had to start lower somewhere else. So we moved to Scripps Ranch and uh. went up $100,000 for a house that was smaller than our house in in Mary Mason. No kidding. What, yeah. My mom never understood that concept, but that's okay. I just knew that we had to do this at some point. It was painful. We ate a lot of macaroni and cheese and and tuna. <laughs> I mean, you know, you go up 100000 in payment yeah. uh, today, yesterday, whenever. Oh, yeah. You're going to have to make some sacrifice. It's significant. And, and our kids knew. We, I mean, a special day is going to McDonald's for a happy meal on a Friday. Yeah, yeah huge. Yeah, it was huge. huge. Mm-hmm. So if baby number one was what age? Um. At the now, she is going to be thirty eight in August. 30, so you had her at uh, what what age were? We so that were, were twenty five. Twenty five. Okay. Mm-hmm. Then baby number two came when three years, two and three quarters years later. Yep. So we're twenty seven, twenty eight, and then we had the two of them. And one of our dreams was to go on vacation. My family never went on one vacation. My yeah. family never went. Bill's family did. Yeah. He did. They put them, piled them all up in a station wagon and took them wherever they would haul them around. But my family never went. And we never went out to dinner hardly ever. Wow. Ever. We just did not spend the money to do that. Yep. And so one of my goals, you know, we started writing. We we started goal setting. I um, Let's see, Brianna. Maybe she was like in kindergarten. We started goal setting. And I said, I want to go on a vacation. And Brianna was in third grade. She was eight years old when we went on our first vacation with the kids Mm -hmm. and it it took that long i mean that's why people don't understand they're all into instant gratification right delayed gratification is even more meaningful and you could ask my kids when we would go to ross they would show me something they want to buy can i buy this and i go is it under ten dollars and they would look at it put it back 
put it back yeah. if it's not under ten dollars. Yes. So they have stories that they hold on to against me, but I think it taught them something. <laughs> Hopefully, the appreciation of the dollar. The I money. would. I would say so. Yeah. But both are homeowners. You know, both my oldest daughters are homeowners. So I, they bought homes. Um, <laughs> My oldest daughter bought her home a year after graduating from Cal State San Marcos. Wow. And Chelsea bought her home a month. She closed escrow a month after graduation from Cal State San Marcos. Mm -hmm. And are they going to, uh, is everybody here in San Diego still or no? Yeah, we all are in Scripps Ranch. Um, Four of our five daughters work at our store and my son-in-law. No kidding. Yeah. That's why I'm saying like we're the oldest business in San Diego, a retail business that's actually owned and operated by family. So people, you know, when I when they see Collins on there, I go, yeah, it's really us. You're Mrs. Collins? I go, yeah, it's really me. I don't look like a Collins, that's yeah, why. Right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I call myself Chirish, actually. Chirish? Yeah. <laughs> that's what I am. And so- and I've been Irish a long, lot longer than a Chinese last name, so. That's, that's hilarious. Yeah. So Okay, so when did you start, when did you adopt? So when we were in our first home in Scripps Ranch, we read an article from the Union Tribune on June 25th, 1995. It was the Sunday section, and it had a whole tabloid about the journey of a mom from Poway, and I think she still lives in Poway, going to China to pick up her baby. And here I'm Chinese, and I had no idea about the one-child child policy. I had no idea that it was happening. That's how oblivious I was. And... I read it and I said, you know, we had just spent a ton of money on our house to remodel and add on to it. I mean, at that time, I think we spent like 100000 It was a lot of money. And uh, I said, we don't have the money to adopt. <sighs> I mean, it just kind of, I wasn't the person I watched Little Orphan Annie said, oh, one day I'm going to adopt a, a, a little orphan. Yeah. You know, I just wasn't that person. And it just wouldn't leave me. God. So, so when you read the story, it yes. inspired you? Yes. What's the one child child? What did you say there? I didn't know that that they were people would select to, to have a boy, and if they had a girl, they would abandon her so they could have another chance at having a boy. Uh, uh, I didn't know where where was this in China? Oh, in China. It had and this was 1995. The very first kids that had been adopted from China was just starting to happen in '94. Yeah. So we were a part of a wave of of solutions for these children. And so after I read it, I, I, oh my gosh, it would not leave my head. And I, and so this is June 95 and almost right away, we contacted the, the agency that was featured in the newspaper and we submitted to apply for an adoption in yeah. China. We did our home study. We, you know, I was crying every morning because I was so scared because, you know, I had a poverty mindset from this childhood I yes. had. I Like I finally, you know, I finally have a nice house and I have furniture that I could buy and I have a car that I loved. I had a red Volvo 740. I loved it. Yeah. And I just said, well, I don't want to give this up. I, You know, there's table for four, rooms for four, cars for four. I mean, it seemed so easy to have two of us and two daughters, right? And it, it just... My husband would say, don't, don't do it if you don't want to do it. You know, it's different from when you're pregnant. You could stop an adoption process anytime. And I would cry and say, no, because there's someone who's waiting for us who's somewhere. And, you know, this is, we have to keep going. And with his encouragement, we kept going. Yeah. And sure enough, in January, we, we had everything done. It takes a while to get all your paperwork together. We submitted. And in all that time we were waiting to find out who our baby was, I just had a feeling that she would have the same birthday as Chelsea, my second one, yeah. March 26th. Yeah. They, we're on our way to Santa Barbara and the agency calls. Are you sitting down? I go, oh, when's her birthday? <laughs> I didn't even say what's her yeah. name. They said March 26th. I go, oh my gosh, I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew she was going to have the same birthday as You're Chelsea. Me. Yeah. And so it was March. It was Jul- June or July. Yeah, it was July when we got the call. And then... Um, we were told that we are planning to travel to go get our babies like in September. And I had made all kinds of friends in San Diego, all of us who decided we were adopting from China from this agency. Wow. We just made this huge network of family members, uh, people we knew that we were all adopting together. Because when China assigns your baby, you're assigned in batches and according to your agency. So your group 10 or 11, we were 10. Uh, and so... It's like you're, you're, they're almost like siblings because they were all assigned a family at the same time. Yeah. It's kind of cool. Um, and so we got to know these people in San Diego and, and we did gatherings together. And 
in September, we were told we were going to leave at Thanksgiving to get to plan to leave. We had pictures of our babies, our Chinese names, these little tiny pictures uh-huh. of their of our babies, and we would all cherish it and carry it around and show people our new baby girl. And what happens? They said that my baby was not special needs enough. Not special really? needs enough. You need to take <clears throat> a more special needs child. Uh, at the time, she had a what? birthmark on her forehead, a rosy colored birthmark. And that was considered a special needs because she had a birthmark. They wanted a more severe special needs for them not to have to take care of, whether it's um, club feet, yeah. cleft palate. <sighs> So they all left without me, all the people that I was assigned with, with our baby. Yeah. And I started putting her picture away because I realized maybe I'm not getting her after all. Right. And then they come back with their babies and I still don't know what I'm doing. They come back without, without, without yeah. my baby. Yeah. Um, so they come back like December 7th or 8th or something like that. And I and had- the fit, So the families do, had actually had to go over there? Yeah, for two weeks. Wow. And they, came, they left Thanksgiving week and they came back with their babies. And here I had a Christmas outfit for her for her first Christmas with us. And it was just heart wrenching. Just, I mean, I tried to be happy for everyone, yeah. but I was really hard. This is really, really, you know, an adoption journey has its ups and downs, just as any fertility journey has its ups and downs. And I just, you know, would cry. Then I cried yeah. for the other reason, not crying because I wanted to adopt. No, I was crying because I was not going to get the baby I want, yeah. I was supposed to have. And we started seeking other alternatives to adopt because our home study would expire. So we started looking at Korea. And in Korea, it's the opposite. They only have boys. The people in Korea kept their girls and they have plenty of little baby boys. So we had a choice of like seven little baby boys that we could have chose from. And I was kind of fine tuning who we would choose. And then right when we were going to choose who the boy would be, we get called on Friday the 13th. What? December, Friday the 13th. And you know what? There's a Friday the 13th coming up this, this week. There is. Yeah, this I, week. I never look at Friday the 13th the same anymore. It's like a day of opportunity. This was, and this was your the original daughter? Yes. And he calls and it's seven o'clock and he says, get ready. He goes, get ready to go. I go, this is a joke for Friday the 13th. He goes, no. China just called and said, get ready to come and get your baby. And I go, what are you are you are you kidding me and this is friday the 13th wow i leave on christmas day i live on leave on christmas day to head up we flew out of SeaTac as our port of exit yeah and i got sick we went to a soccer game screamed our throats out and i got sick i had a huge fever <laughs> probably back then you would have thought it was sars um i had a huge fever and i was i I didn't know what to do. My mom said, don't go, don't go. And I said, mommy, what are you talking about? I have to go get my baby. I'm crawling on the floor. I'm so feverish. <laughs> wow. And one of our employees gave me um, echinacea with golden seal root. Yeah. And I took it and I woke up on Christmas day and I had no fever. Wow. Mm-hmm. I had no fever. I had a little bit of cough, but I had no fever. Probably, you know, I mean, people think about COVID. Probably, that was like COVID probably back then in 96. Um, but yeah, I got on that plane and I went there and got my baby. Wow. And came home on January 9th. And she was nine months old. So I would have had her at um, seven and a half, eight months old, but I got her at nine months old uh, instead. But yeah. hey. Hey. We're not picky. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So hus- hubby didn't go with you? No, he needed to stay. He was originally, we were just so busy with our yeah, Christmas season. Course. He needed to stay home with our two older daughters yep. and do what they and needed to the do. And run the business. And run the business, yes. Yep. But they were all, We originally we were all going to go. We got our passports done. All of us had gotten passports done. But yeah, I ended up going alone, which is highly unusual for a mom yeah. to go without someone. Huh. But I figured it out. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so, so <clears throat> and then, and then. How long after did you decide to have like how was it to have an adopted child as opposed to your own? Can you can you touch on that? So there, yeah, um, we had. You know a, what I'm saying? Like, yeah. give me the give me the feeling. Did you just didn't even my think kids, about it? My kids were not like the pastor that spoke this past Sunday. His his sons were praying for, you know, a little girl, and then they got a little girl. What was it? Was it them that said that? And so my kids did not pray for a little sister. Yeah. They didn't even ask. They love being just the two of them. So one day I'm sitting in my home office and my, my, my eight-year-old comes up to me and she says, oh, I said, Chelsea, what's wrong, baby? And she, cause she's my baby for eight years, yeah. right? Oh, Brianna's like Marsha from the Brady Bunch and Emma's, I mean, Annalise is like Cindy 
and the Brady Bunch. And I'm like, Jan, and nobody sees me anymore. And I felt so <laughs> heartbroken. She was crying. Oh, geez. And I said, oh, Chels. I said, oh, my gosh. So we purposely committed to not miss a single soccer game ever, ever. Yeah. Like one of us would be at any every any game that she ever right. played she was our premier athlete of our family she ended up going on i mean she was an amazing athlete in soccer and volleyball and we never missed a game for her love it yeah so but it, once she let it out she seemed so much better yeah <laughs> I, but you can imagine as a mom i mean your heart is just broken yeah. yeah and there's and there is an adjustment whether it's bio or adopted, there is an adjustment when you've had a child who's been the only youngest one for eight years or nine years or 10 years or whatever. There is a little bit of adjustment. So you have to get, you have to feed it and, and feed the child with some positive things and do things together. We purposely, we could have adopted a boy because I was Chinese heritage and China wants to give the Chinese heritage the sons. Right. I could have, but I visioned because there was so much age difference between the kids that I felt like girls was the way to go so that we would have a sisterhood. And I was right. Uh. I was super right. So then three years later, we got Delaney. And then three years later, we got Emma. And we were already 38 and 41 and 44 years old also. So we started What age was the, the, the second two? What age okay. were those? So Bria... So Annalise was nine months when we brought her home. And then Delaney was 11 months, which is... First, you said 16 months? Uh, second one? Sorry, second one. How old she was? Yeah. 11 months. 11. And then Emma was 10 months. So all girls? Yeah. In three different provinces uh, along like along the Yonsei River. And you already had two girls. Mm -hmm. So five girls. So there was 18 years difference between Brianna and Emma. What about your husband here? He didn't say, I want a boy? No. And you know what? He was a beaten man when I got him because he had seven sisters already. But, <sighs> you know, he just knew when you're- He was a beaten man. Yeah. He, he knew. You know, you don't mess with the girls at certain times of the month, right? Um, so- <laughs> And he had a very, very matriarchal mom. Yeah. She was like the matriarch of that family. So yeah. she was he was used to strong females in in, in dealing wow. with them. Yeah. He was really the right guy for me, you know, birth wow. order. I'm second of seven. He was the first boy after five girls, six number six after girls. Birth order is real, real. Did he ever bring it up that he wanted a boy or no? He just never, never it was never even a topic? No, I think he just loved our daughter so much. Of course. And when we got our first grandson, I did not know what to do with that boy. I, when he when he went potty training for the first time, I didn't know what to do with him. But we did finally get a grandson. Yeah. And so that, and then we have two grandsons. Now. Our first adopted uh -huh. daughter had a boy. And so we have two grandsons. And so now we have our boys, right? And they're a kick, they're a kick in the pants, right? Yeah. They're really, I mean, God is funny. He has a sense of humor. He gives us kick in the pants boys. Yes. Um, so we have our boys now. But our, you know, because Chelsea was so athletic, it, it was because of her athleticism. Mm. He got to live vicariously through her. Yeah. Her, he was a very a athletic guy too. And so he got to live vicariously through her being on the number one teams of volleyball and soccer and, you know, winning championships and things like that. He, he really got a lot out of that. And did you, uh, after adoption number one, which came for like, because of a cause of like kind of quote unquote, saving these babies from China, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. After that point, did you think about biologically having another one or you just weren't able or what was the, uh, you said, you know, what, let's just adopt from here. Now it's a lot easier. No, we made a conscious decision not to have any more children. Yeah. We took permanent decisions to do that. So and was we, there anything that helped that decision? Like why you went, uh, or was it just adoption? You kind of like that flow better? You know what? I, I'll tell you the story where Samuel was called by God and, 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 and it, I can only tell you, cause that was truly a vocation from God. Um, when Samuel was called, you know, he heard God's calling him, Samuel, Samuel, and he goes and he goes, are you calling me? And he goes, no, go back to sleep. And Samuel, Samuel, are you calling me? And, you know, I, it, see, this is the thing. I actually, now that we're part of a church that we can discern God's voice more, God was totally calling me to do something that I was not comfortable to do. And I abided. Mm. I abided. You're obedient. I was obedient. And he's said that I will take care of you if you do something that maybe you don't want to do, but I want you to do. And so learning obedience from this is what made our faith journey so powerful. Um, it really was scary because at the time, in the economic times, we have to back, think back to 95 yep. and 96. We were just coming out of the Persian Gulf. Right. We were in a huge recession, huge recession. Yep. In my real estate office, people agents had lost their homes and lost their cars 
yeah. you, you never hear that today. No. Uh-uh. People weren't talking to me because all of a sudden I was selling like crazy. I was up on the board and I would tell them, this is not my money. It's God's money. Ah, uh, ha Because they would look a little jealous. Yes. A little insecure. You know, you name it. They were struggling. They were living off of their credit card um trying to get by they would they would take advances on their credit cards to live why you know so this is the thing where i can look back and say wow god's hand was totally in this and i went to our priest at the time our pastor at the time and i just felt compelled i need to talk to you i need to talk you and i was sobbing and sobbing and sobbing he goes what's wrong i go i don't know why god wants me to do this i have no idea why he wants me to do this This is so uncomfortable because i had such a poverty mindset at the time yes and he goes well why not you i go that's not what I wanted you to say to me. <laughs> and so why not you? Yeah. Why not you? Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. It was, uh, you could, I mean, nothing's more embarrassing than sniveling and having a boogie nose right in front of your pastor. But I was sobbing because I was so torn by, by, by saying yes. I wanted to say no because I was so uncomfortable. But why won't I say yes? Because I could trust God. And that means I wasn't trusting him. Why didn't I trust him? He's been good and faithful to me all this time. And so, again, it happened with Delaney. I was working 60, 70 hours a week. I had, in that year, in 98, 99, 99, it was 99 because I didn't get her until the end of the year. I had sold 40, represented 47 buyers and sellers in 99. And I did not have an assistant. Like today, everyone seems to have an assistant. I did it all on my own. And I was in church and I was again sobbing. I was so embarrassed. I was in the in the bathroom at church crying and a woman walks in and goes, what's wrong? I go, I don't know. I'm working like 60, 70 hours a week. How can I take care of another baby? This is crazy. And and the girls have two sports each. They're doing club volleyball and high, and, and high school soccer and then vice versa. I mean, how am I supposed to take care of another child? And, and of course, this woman was widowed mm. and had to take care of two kids on her own after her husband died young in the 40s. And I was like, well, I said to her, I mean, you're the wrong person for me to talk to you about this because here you are. You're raising your kids by yourself without your husband. She goes, no, God would never give you anything that you could not handle. Right. Wow. Yeah. I said, wow. And this is in a bathroom. Yeah. The word of God in the bathroom. Oh, so dry off my eyes, suck it back up and go back to church and sit with my family because they knew something was wrong. Like, yeah. mom, where's mom going? I don't know. Leave her alone. <laughs> Let her do whatever she does. <laughs> And I go, and when I get to China, and I'm holding my daughter, and I'm like crying, I go, gosh, thank you, God. And this was number two now? Yes. Yeah. And I cried and cried. I go, thank you so much. I said, I'm so sorry that I didn't think I could do this, but I can. Yeah. So give me the give me the, um, the apprehension. Like, why was that so uncomfortable? What's the main thing that made you uncomfortable about doing this? Was it financially? Yeah. Really? Yeah. It wow. Poverty mindset. Mm-hmm. Poverty mindset. Mm-hmm. I got it from my father. Yeah. It's, it's generational. It's generational. Yeah. Yep, it was generational. My mom didn't have it. My mom was a little more well-to-do than my dad was. Um, my dad came out of China starving, hungry, hungry, so hungry. They weren't starving to death. They were just hungry all the time. They gave them enough, just enough rice to not make them starve, but they were so hungry all the time. And so when he came here, it was he was literally like eight, nine. I think like 20, 19, 20 years old, all by himself. And I didn't even know this term until I saw a movie at one of the uh, international film festivals that he was a parachute child. You send your strongest kid and he was the youngest of three, he was the youngest of three brothers and he went, he felt guilty. Why did he get to come to America? And his brother didn't, right? Yeah. But he was the strongest. So they sent him and they send you over there and you hopefully land, you land and you need to do well and send money back to the family. You need to establish a stronghold in your new country wow. and bring people here. You need to be that one. But he's only a kid. I mean, gosh, today you send a kid out to do what we're talking about. I don't even think any of them, you know, whether they know they're a, a guy or a girl. I mean, they're just like right. so confused. Today, you have to know who you are. You are the son and you are going to not let your mom down and you are going to be a success. It's not an option. You cannot yeah. be on drugs. You cannot get to be an alcoholic. You need to go. But some people do. They come here and they get stuck sucked into the culture of drinking or gambling or whatever. Yep. That yeah. was Chinese people. That was a lot of things that happened that way. Smoking. Um, 
So my dad comes under a lot of pressure to do well. And so for him, I mean, the only way to make the money to do what he needed to do to raise a family was to work two or three jobs a wow. week, yeah, including graveyard, including every friggin' weekend. Yeah. My dad never went to a game. He, when I, I even remember when I, when I got my valedictorian award, my dad was not there. Wow. I mean, he it, today post people will feel victimized. Oh, my dad didn't do it. Well, I think some of my siblings felt that way that he well, did. He wasn't there for them. And I said, well. Give him a break. He's worked two or three jobs. You know, I was very cognizant of the sacrifice my parents were making. Um, so some, it just depends how cognizant you were about that and not feeling victimized, saying, oh, my dad didn't show up in my game. He never saw me win the tournament or whatever. You know, so we're cognizant. Which brings me to the subject of parenting. Yeah. I was, was going to ask specifically about this. I told our children that we're going to take the best things from each of our parents. Yes. And leave the bad behind. There's no perfect set of parents, but take what you left. My my family and Bill's family both were huge work ethic people. Yep. Huge. So when we asked our kids to work, we tell them we didn't ask you to do anything that we didn't do. Dad and I have worked since we were 14 years old. Wow. I was cleaning chalkboards. Yep. In case you don't know what a chalkboard is, there's sidewalk chalk. Well, they make little pieces of chalk that you write on a board. Yeah. And I was cleaning all the chalkboards when all the kids were going off to round table pizza or somewhere to go get pizza. I couldn't even afford pizza, honestly. I never ate out. I couldn't afford to eat out. But I was carrying around all the erasers and the chamois to get the, the school boards ready for the next school day. That's what I did for $1.36 an hour. Wow. Wow. Covered, are my glasses there, would there, be covered with chalk dust. Are there no more chalkboards? Those are gone. <laughs> no, the kids have chalkboards. They, uh, they use it for, they have a wipe erase board usually on one side so, and a, a chalkboard on the other. It's a whiteboard. You have whiteboards, but I see, uh, okay. I, I, because I see sidewalk chalk, so they know oh, what yeah, chalk yeah, is. Yeah, so yeah, sidewalk okay. chalk is still out there at least. But yeah, I, I mean, but this is, what I, I, my parents didn't ask me to do this. I did it on my own because I felt like I needed to help them. And so let's, let me stamp this in here because, and this is so huge, Cynthia, that when it comes to generational stuff, mm -hmm. uh, poverty conscious mindsets, uh, abuse, mm -hmm. uh, name it, go down mm -hmm. the list mm -hmm. here. It's so important with, for us as parents to break the cycles. Yes. How do you, like, how do you, because most families don't. It's so hard. It's so hard. It's how you were socialized. And when you're, and you know, that's one of my favorite classes I took at Cerritos Community College is one of my GE classes was sociology, actually, when it was taught right. Um, that you're socialized to be the father that you are because of how you were raised. You're socialized to be the mother that you are. And how many times do you say, oh my gosh, I sounded just like my mom. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I sounded just like my yeah. dad. And you hate that. How did right. that. How did that little voice come out like that? So it takes a lot of conscious effort to change a generational curse, whether it's from child rearing or you know how you speak to people or how you feel about money, how, uh, you know, it, it happens. And if, I think the most important part is to be conscious of it. Once you realize it, you know, you speak it if you think it kind of a thing. It, like, you know, how, where do you start though? Don't like, ignore it. Just say, no, you're, you're, you know, you're making that up. You know, you're, it's a yeah. part of your imagination. Uh, no, if, if you can admit that's, that's a what big it is. step. That's I think, what it is. Admit it. Because my dad, admit I don't it. know if he would ever admit he was the way he was or my mom would admit that she was the way she was. Yeah. How does it make you feel like right now when you like or, or in your in your life along the years? Did it affect you? And you because you said you understood he sacrificed, he worked, but to never go to a game mm -hmm. to never go to. I mean, mm -hmm. did it affect you in a way like and you're strong, obviously very strong. Mm -hmm. So you're an anomaly of a human being that mm -hmm. can just oh, yeah, I'm good. I'm, I'm just move mm -hmm. forward. I stay positive. I keep the faith in the Lord and. Mm -hmm. But most kids don't have this type of a strength no. or power to to brush that off, and mm -hmm. it affects them for the rest of their life, mm -hmm. right? It can, if unless they decide to consciously stop the cycle. Now, my husband's mom was the opposite. She went to every game he yeah. played. Yeah. <laughs> so this is where I got to see, how is that? Oh, the other thing is we never got a Christmas present. Really? We had a tree. I wrote to Santa one time, put out some roasted chestnuts because I supposed to was went through the Sears catalog, circled the things I wanted in my Sears catalog. <laughs> the Sears catalog. Uh, the Sears catalog. Spencer, you don't know the about wish the Sears book. catalog. The wish book. It's Chris, called the wish book. Chris, do you remember the Sears catalog? Right. Yeah. The Sears catalog. That was where we. Yes. Now that's why it's called the wish book. <laughs> I never got anything out of the wish book. Nothing. It's just uh, wishing. Just what wishing. did they say? Santa's just not coming this year. Or? 
Again, I ne- you know, I was so, ca- I was such a good daughter. I never made my mom and dad feel guilty. Never. But one day, I'm sitting in my Compton house. The chestnuts are eaten and gone. And there, I have my long list of things that I wanted. I printed nicely, very nicely on the fireplace. And there's nothing there. Oh, boy. And I look out the window. I look out the curtain. And it's, and it's already getting to be daylight. I go, did you forget? Did you forget? You can come back. I'm okay with that. Nothing. 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 So we vowed that we would always buy gifts for our children. Now my mom, my mother-in-law was totally the opposite. This is a woman has like 20 million grandkids. She would shop, what is oh. that, L, uh, Lillian Vernon catalog. And she would get like these <laughs> what, little- L.L. Bean? What about L.L. Yeah, Bean? No, but Lillian Vernon was yeah, a big yeah, thing for yeah, her. Yeah. And she would get the things that come from the 99 cents or type of things in there. But every child had something to open. Even yeah. every grandchild had something to open. The best. And so we got to the, we have a little game at our house that I started um, that we, each kid has five, 10 gifts to open Yeah. on Christmas morning, 10. You yeah. have 10 things. And when I met my husband, I started something too. We, we, he turned 21. I gave him 21 gifts. And some were little and some were big. And someone was, some things took a lot of time. I made him this crocheted afghan that took me forever to do, um, to make for his bed. And I still have that. Um, and then we carried it on to our children. Our daughter just will be 38. And she, I said, when is this going to stop? I have to wrap 38 things. They get a lot of toilet paper, don't worry. They oh, to this yes. day, you're still doing yes. this? Yes. <laughs> and then we just had the double birthday on March 26th, and that daughter turned 35, and the other one turned 26. So add that two together. That was a lot wow. of things. So you get a lot of gum. You got a lot of toilet paper. They actually went toilet, toilet paper. paper. Was, well, when toilet paper was short, that's the thing you wanted, really. You get toilet paper, but, you know, gum. And there will be like a really good gift and uh, some clothing. And then now that they have kids, I give gifts to their kids as one of it, like a new t shirt. And that's one of their gifts of the 38 things is gifts for their children. Oh, my God. It's gosh. really hard to buy 38 things. How old is your youngest child right now? Emma is just 19. Just 19. Yeah, she'll be 20. What did, what did you do about the last uh, five years with devices? Cell oh, phones, very difficult. Like... It's the bane of our existence for sure. Correct. I, I, I must admit that I have pretty much given up that battle. It's, 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 it's very a very, difficult. very, very difficult battle. Our older kids will tell you that they were the last ones to get a cell phone. They were one of the last ones. We did not let them have a cell phone until high school. Oh, wow. That's, uh, that's late. And they, believe me, I heard it all oh, the yeah, time. So-and-so has it. So-and-so has one. Yeah. Why can't I have one? Why can't yeah. I have one? And so it really, so the battle began. So unfortunately, you know, we all end up breaking down and getting yeah. cell phones. I mean, there's nothing and, you can do about it. And I used to be where the computer was in the kitchen so I could watch what they were doing on the computer and the internet. And that's gone by the wayside. There's yeah, that's nothing. Gone. I feel bad for the families today. Well, they feed it. Every child's looking at an iPad. Yep. They're looking at their phone. Every little kid in a stroller is looking at a phone. Yep. It's really bizarre. Um, and they don't give them books. I mean, I used to always have my di- So this is another fun story. When I would go to a high school game and I would br- get my newest baby and bring her in with a stroller. And of course, none of our none of our people had babies. They all had kids that are already in high school. And I'm rocking in with our little ones. And I said, if you ever need anything in my diaper backpack, I have everything between tampons and diapers. What do you need? You know, so I would be, and then, would, then they got to the funny part where, so Mrs. Collins, when are you getting another one? I go, don't you think three is enough? You know, and it was like they expected us to bring home another baby, yeah. which I kind of actually thought we were going to do one final adoption of an older child, and maybe like an 11-year-old, because when you get to a certain age, you cannot adopt them. They're aged out. Oh, really? They're stuck forever. If you come and you don't finish their adoption within that birthday, wherever, whatever country it is, yeah. they're stuck. They aged out. Okay, so and you've adopted now three. Mm-hmm. Three. So I originally wanted an older child, like an 11-year-old. To... All, all from China? Yeah, I wanted one at that time. But, but all I... three are from China? Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. They're from three different provinces. Okay, so talk to me about the adoption thing. The people right now, and I'm one of them, mm-hmm. thinking about adopting... Talk to me about the journey. Like, what do you advise? Where do we go? Where do we look if we don't mm-hmm. want to go all the way to China to get a, a baby? I, I mean, do we I, get them young? What age? Mm-hmm. I think that most of the people that want a baby, this is why the abortion fight is so important because, it, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, you know, everyone is affected by it. And our family was, and um, my sister in law had placed a child for adoption at a young age. She had a child, and my husband's youngest sister, and and she actually met him he's now whatever 42 years old or something and what a sacrifice to give that child a better chance 
yes. with a family. That takes a lot, right? It takes right. a lot. I mean, my in-laws could have said, hey, we're going to keep them and raise them or whatever. Those are choices that they make. But they did do that. And I admired them so much for doing that. Um, it takes a lot of courage. I think about all the Chinese women who gave up and I would say, oh my gosh, they're the most pro-life women in the world. No, I don't. They don't like their girls. I go, yes, they do. They didn't kill them. Yeah. They could have aborted them, drowned them in the toilet, drowned them in the river, but they didn't. They safely right. abandoned them, usually in front of a police station or a hospital, so know that they're going to be found and give them a chance to find a forever home that gives them a chance maybe to go to college. And that's why I wanted an older 11-year-old, because some of those kids are super motivated. All they want to do is go to university. Yeah. But they can't. Because there's no one who's going to help them get there. Right. And that's why I wanted one older child to someone. And I hear amazing stories of those older girls that come here at 13 years old. And they're just so self-motivated, high achievers, striving for the best. Because they feel they were given they were given the golden ticket from Willy Wonka. They just knew. And, and right now, are these kids still like yes. available? Those are called waiting children. The really? older children, they're over four years old. Are called what about waiting. the younger ones? Still young ones too? When I went, so Bill and I went to China. He didn't go with me. I took him back to see the girls' orphanages um, in 2019 and there's only special needs kids there. That's it. Mm -hmm. um, older, I think they're still waiting older children that are totally normal yeah. and non-special needs but we saw severe mental special needs oh, there man. in the institutions now and if Anyone has a club foot or club out, yeah. that's not a problem. Heart three, not a problem. Those kids will be adopted because people will take that. That's fine. But the mental special needs of um, Down syndrome or whatever, yeah. missing a chromosome or extra chromosome is yeah. very difficult. And those are wards of the country, of the state oh, for the rest of their life. Wow. They will take care of those people all through adulthood. That's part of the plan. That's wow. part of the plan right now. So these kids are happy, though. They have really great orphanages now. They built new orphanages for all our kids. And they all have music rooms. And um, they have planned itineraries every day. So it's, it's really wonderful to see the country step up and take care of their um, orphan children that are special needs. Okay, so now talk to me about when did the cancer start? So go to 2020. And March 15th. They forced our store to shut down. They forced everyone to shut down pretty yeah. much from March 15th to May 29th. And then Gavin Newsom said at the end of May, oh, we might need to stay shut down a little bit longer. And here we already flattened the curve. Didn't we say we were going to flatten the curve? We did flatten the curve. Yeah. And uh, I think I just about lost it. I was like, if you, if anyone knows, if they own, anyone owns a business, believe us, no one stops the space rent. No one stops right. the insurance payments. No one stops the utilities. And that doesn't include your house payments. Correct. I didn't know how we were going to do it. My daughters worked so hard behind the scenes to work with anyone who would work with us, but it's not like normal day-to-day -day, um, sales. So I thought, oh my gosh, if this is going to happen, this is... so I think the stress of that situation precipitated. So I got a card in the mail saying, oh, we've opened up for mammograms. Come on over. And I said, oh, you know, I haven't gone in a, a year and a half. I said, I better go. And I go in and it's July, I think it was like July 17th in 2020. And I go in and, and you see the look on their face. Had, had you had any? Uh, no, this is nothing. just a no, You're just feeling routine great. mammogram. And they get that look on their face. Okay, can you come back this afternoon for a biopsy? And I go, and I mean, that, that radiologist said, you will come back, right? You come back, right? And she's a Filipino doctor. I go, yeah. I'm going to be back. Okay, calm down. They tell you why they were so worried? No, I already knew. You know, I just knew the look on their face, what yeah. they were doing. So they did a five needle biopsy that afternoon. And while she's looking on her computer monitor, I kind of take a picture of that little sucker because it was star shaped. Yeah. And so it looked like he had broken out of the milk duct. And I said, okay. And then, you know, that was Monday. And then Wednesday, my doctor, I see his name on, I do have a landline still, sorry. <laughs> um, I look at his name and I said, I answer the phone. I go, I have cancer, huh? He goes, yeah. I go, okay, so let's get to it. What do I do next? What do I have to do to get this out of me? Yeah. Um, honestly, I had already booked my trip to see Trump get inaugurated in January. I said, we need to hurry up and do this because I want to go to the inauguration. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. mean, I had yeah. booked our hotel and our flights and everything. I said, we need to go. And I need to do, chop, chop, let's yeah. go. And so... Um, you know, he goes, well, okay, I'll have the breast coach call you and, and uh, tell you what your next steps are. And 
you know, they talk, they give you three doctors, you have your surgeon in our in sharp, they have a general surgeon, an on onco- uh, radiology oncologist and plastic surgeon, right? Three. Yep. And I go and talk to um, our general surgeon. And he's not a breast surgeon. He's a general surgeon. He does all kinds of surgery for men and women. And he goes, well, I think I could do this with a lumpectomy with a shot of radiation. And I said, no, you're not going to do that. Yeah, I, I think I can get good margins. I go, no, no, we're going to take them off. And he goes, well, that, that's a little extreme. You know, you want to do an Angelina Jolie? I said, uh, I can't believe you just said that to my husband and I. But, uh, you know, I'm thinking this in my, he- in my head. Yeah, yeah. And I said, yeah, actually, if that's what you want to call it. And then he goes, well, you know, it's like killing an ant with a sledgehammer. I go, yeah, but that's a dead ant, isn't it? Yeah. Because I have friends who have are not on this earth and they were being too nice you know there was a, a time when they, you saw they went the other route yeah for they a, kind of vanity reasons a little bit excellent i tell people if you get it do you want to make your decisions on whatever it's this or that if you make it with a capital h for health and not a v for vanity you will always make the best decision for your right. body yeah it's just call it out and you know, I said, well, I'll let you know, you know, it's Wednesday and then Friday tech, I messaged him. I said, take them both off. When's the soonest I can get in? And it was September uh, 14th and our anniversary is Valentine's Day. So 14th sound like a good day. Yeah. And so you see that how quickly that's for less wow. than 45 days. And no one, I have yet to meet someone in San Diego who has done a non-reconstructive um, double mastectomy. And it's a movement, actually. Um, but I thought it was ironic that so tell they... So me, tell me, hit on that real quick, like, because so you, you have options. Y- they didn't present that as an option. They didn't? No. The they never heard was, of such a thing. The they, only option was to... To put be, fake boobs back in you. Yeah. And I had no idea. You have to exchange those every 10 years. They said, you want me to come back when I'm 71, 81, and 91? I don't think so. For intentional surgery? Yeah. No. I mean, this is like, you have to be a free thinker. You have to question things. And, 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 then, and then when I talked to our, um, radio, our oncologist, oncology radiologist, he, his daughter played soccer with our daughter. So he was from Scripps Ranch. And, and he goes, well, I guess, you know, I guess I'm not going to, you're not going to need me because um, this is my hope to do it without having chemo and radiation. Because why would you ruin your immune system with radiation and chemo? You're never the same. I don't Never. Never. You, you will never be the same. Right. And I was going to do whatever it took to not do radiation and, and chemotherapy. And um, he goes, well, I'll be on the sideline on a bench cheering for you. And, you know, paid for that consultation. But Of course, you're you right. Know, yeah, 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 paid yeah, for that yeah. consultation. Sure. But I said, yeah, that's fine. I never got even to the point where I talked to a plastic surgeon. Um, and I didn't, I, I had one girlfriend who had her double mastectomy in May, in May. And she told me, you know, Ma, you know, Cynthia, maybe you can check into like prosthesis and stuff. I go, what did you say? I've never heard that word. Oh, you could have fake boobs, right? If you wanted to, you know, where you can have things that you can do inserts and wear a bra and have them. So that started that journey of going into a holistic approach towards my surgery. And my husband was it was hard he heard the doctor say hey I, you know he thinks he could do a lumpectomy and not do this and i i it was a little bit of a journey for bill yeah, it was a little yeah. bit and every husband it will be um some more than others and i was we were really lucky we had a good therapist that we could talk to to understand and work through it a little bit um and and then we were fine and wouldn't you know so we go into surgery i ask my doctor to pray over me and over his hands before we go in before I walk into the surgery room. Yeah. Hey, wait, wait, which doctor? The my surgeon. surgeon. Did he, you already know he was Christian? Yeah, uh, I think I did. And he went to the rock uh-huh. and he said the most amazing prayer, which I wish I could remember, but I don't. But he did. And I go, Dr. Amler, you've done this before. And he didn't say anything. I go in and you get into this warming blanket. It's so warm. And I fell asleep immediately. It's so relaxed not anxious, whatever. And then I asked for the hospital chaplain and she was amazing. And she prayed with me the two mornings I was there at the hospital. And I wake up from surgery and there's Bill. I said, what are you doing here? 
you know, you're coming out of anesthesia. And he goes, they said I could stay with you. And re- believe me, remember, no one was allowed to yes, go in that's to right. the hospital. Not when you're dying, not when you're having surgery. He goes, they said that I can go with, I can stay with you. And I go, are you sure? You know, I'm out of it. And he goes, yeah. And I, and he walks with me. He escorts my bed back to the room from the recovery room to my room. And he's in the room with me. Like, you never heard of this. And you no. never know. And the nurses all come in and go, oh, I didn't get the memo. What are you doing here, sir? You know, and he goes, hey, they said I could. And it was only for, this is a general surgery floor of other surgeries that are probably serious or not. Yeah. Some people died on that while we were there, actually. Uh, it was a, a surgery, a surgical floor. And it was only for spouses of mastectomy patients. That's it. <laughs> Is God good or what? So I'm thinking to myself, this wow. is great. And he could have spent the night. But I told Bill, go home and sleep. You know, go home and sleep in our bed. It's more comfortable. You have the real deal bed to go home to. Oh, no, that's right. <laughs> and then brand right. new real deal bed. And so he goes home and sleeps. And he sleeps well. And he comes back in the morning. And I order enough food from the kitchen to feed him and, you know, feed him breakfast, lunch, and dinner kind of a thing. And we sit there and 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 just marvel. Marvel at the miracle wow. that Bill is sitting in this hospital room. And then within a week after I got out, they closed it down. They would not let anyone come in again. No kidding. Mm-mm. It's like the the Red Sea's parting. And I got he got to come in through the Red Sea, walk through it on dry land, and, and then get out. And then it closed behind him. Yeah, That is incredible. It's incredible. Seriously. And I incredible. can't believe how fast that that transpired Yeah, from, from finding out. Uh-huh. Yes. So tell me about your feeling about it. Like, like it, you seem like you're just so resilient. That it's, okay, hey, I got to get it done. Let's yep. get it done. Bada yep. bing, bada boom. Let's not even think about it. Yeah. And and since then, what's happened? They bring you back every yeah. so often to do x-rays or- Nothing. They... I didn't do anything. I, I mean, I go in to see him next month, my oncologist. I mean, I did an OncoDX test. It was high score, 97% chance I will not get cancer again. 97. And I said, you know what? When my kids come home with a 97% on their test, that's an A. Yeah. I don't need 100%. I don't need, I don't need hormone therapy for that. And how, hormone therapy has so many side effects. I mean, yeah. people don't realize that. I just They need to question everything and weigh it carefully at, 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 when they do it. I said, no, nope, I'll take 97% chance that I'm not going to get cancer again. And I, I will be fine. And so I go on, no chemo, no radiation, and no hormone therapy. And I didn't know about aesthetic flat closure. Flat, clo- flat closure is where you're just, you know, taking them off and just shutting yourself off. Shutting yourself, everything closes up and, you yeah. know, they take as much breast tissue as possible so that there's no chance that one renegade cell got in somewhere. Yeah. I'm not saying, that was one of the things they did say that we don't know where a cell could have gone right. before we had taken off the breast. But um, I get into a group, so the re- so one of my nurses that was uh, pre-operating said to me, she had a double mastectomy, was part of a Facebook group. I go, why didn't I think of that? I think I moved so fast that I really didn't think through everything. Yeah. So I joined a, her Facebook group, but those were people who did reconstruction. I love their big boobs. Yeah. I wasn't part of that group. They yeah. actually looked down on us that have done it like this. Oh, but, really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So then I found a... a f- a really great group called Flat, Fierce, and Forward. Ooh, that sounds like me, right? Yeah. I asked for permission to join the closed group. Over 7,000 women. You're kidding me. And these are between those of us who in recent years chose flat closure from the get-go and those who chose flat closure after their implants. So they're called explants. Ah. Uh, explants. Explants, yeah. And they had breast implant illness. Really? Your body, when your body has an eyelash, your eye is like, oh, 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 until yeah. you get it out, right? Yeah. I'm not saying that it, at, at breast implants aren't, aren't going to affect everyone. No, they don't. But your body is not going to generally accept a foreign object in it. Yeah. In time, you will have, you will have rejection and you will have autoimmune issues. And then sometimes they leak. Some of these pictures of breast implants that have black mold in it, oh my gosh. And then they leaked or they attached, they attached to their rib cage. Your body develops a capsule around it because it's doing a great job to protect you right. yeah. from a foreign object. And they have brain fog and joint pain, autoimmune issues. These women, their testimonies after within two weeks of removing their implants, they could stink clear. Their complexion, their pallor is not gray. It's yeah. cleared and and they're smiling and healthy and it's just it's incredible what people did because no one told any of us what this was about it was never an option yeah, never so, an option so it was like never even presented no. an option and they 
So my oncologist calls me one day and he says, Cynthia, I just want to let you know that we just saw a video module about aesthetic flat closure and we at Sharp are considering making it a standard for those who opt out of reconstruction. And that's where you are, the finish, the micro finish makes you look like a prepubescent boy. It's really super smooth. I really don't know what it entails, how it does, but it not everyone can do it because you have to t- be taught how to do an aesthetic flat closure, AFC. I learned so much. And of course I did it after my surgery, but I am like a little poster child. I'll talk to anyone who's willing to listen because everyone at arm's length is going to know someone who's had breast cancer. Right. And they need to know that this is an option. They need full disclosure that this is an option. Because they don't even present as as an option. Never. Why why is that? And, And these people who came onto this Facebook group, they were shamed out of other Facebook groups of double mastectomy Facebook groups because they opted for no reconstruction. Yeah. Why is this? Cultural. You Cultural. Know, you know, you see all the swimsuits, all the cover of uh, Sports Illustrated. I mean, you don't see any flat women on there. You know, you just, it's a cultural thing of expectation that the bigger, the better. Some of them, you know, some of the doctors say that, oh, we can make them bigger than before. If you were an A cup, you could be a C cup. You know, they go for that yeah. ego or your insecurities as a child wow. when you were growing up in high school and you were flat and you were just an A cup and you wanted you always wanted boobs. Well, I've seen people, they don't look that great. They look saggy after a while. And they, they cut your pectoral muscles. They cut yeah. and slice and dice you to slip it in and they have to sew it to something to stay put, right? Yeah. Think about it. Wow. It's so gross. Um, but the but people, the, my friends who have done it, I'm not going to badmouth them, but I just want them to know if they do have any symptoms of bre- breast implant illness, they need to look at it. Some of these people who have implants did not know about breast implant illness. Yeah. They, they seriously didn't know what was wrong. Their doctor said that was in their head that there was something wrong. So I feel it's my social duty to present my flatness to the world proudly as an option for a breast, a double mastectomy or breast cancer in general. I mean, I took out a healthy breath. Oh, a healthy side. Why were you taking out the healthy? Why didn't you just do one side? There is testimonies of people who, who did their, um, what do you call it? The, the, when they take a test on your cells, the biopsy, they did a biopsy on the breast tissue on the healthy side. And there was new tumors in there that were not there at the MRI yeah. before the surgery. You would have totally ignored it because you would have assumed it was clean. Right. These were miracles that God did for them that said, take them both. I will take care of you. And they find out there was cancer already growing wow. in the healthy breast. So, I, I mean, this is a story because breast is not the end of your life to have uh, breast cancer. No, it's yeah, the beginning. My, my, um, my mother-in-law uh, had it recently and she had a double mastectomy. Um, and frankly, I don't know if she went with the reconstructive. I don't, I actually don't remember, but she, she comes here every few days. She's Buddhist. Yeah. And she does the little Buddha thing and, oh, yeah. and she's sweet. She just chugs along. It was like nothing to her. Yeah. Okay. She gets very I, similar to you. She got it done, but a bing, but a boom. Yep. And I take, I started taking care of my grandkids in January. So my surgery was September and I needed <sighs> to start being strong enough to take care of my three grandkids on Saturdays when our store is open. So I needed to recuperate quickly. I, yeah. I had things to do. And I'm in, I'm the manager of our service unit in Scripps Ranch. I govern over 480 girls. And I came home on Wednesday. What's that all about? <laughs> I love it because we serve God in our country. It's our Girl Scout promise. Yeah. And so I've been managing now. This is going on my 13th year managing in Scripps Ranch. What and is it? What, what organization? Girl is Scouts. Girl Scouts. Mm-hmm. No way. Mm-hmm. I I don't have any kids in Girl Scouts anymore, but I still manage because I I I believe in in serving God in my country. So I love saying that Girl Scout promise. And I had my wow. I had my leader meeting on the Monday after my surgery. Thanks to Zoom, I was home and I could sit at my chair, even though I just come out of surgery and have a meeting. And and then they did an amazing meal train for me. So every day that some of the moms brought me oh. a meal for dinner. Um but this is how, you know, a lot of people could say, hey, I, I can't do this anymore. I'm this or I'm that. And I just keep moving on. I mean, people go, oh, my gosh, you just you just had surgery last week. And now you're here. We were at Costco the day after I came home from surgery. And they go, Mrs. Collins, weren't you just did you just have surgery on Monday? I go, yeah, I did. Wow. <laughs> and they're like, well, what are you doing here? I go, being very careful that I don't hit my chest with a shopping cart, you know? Yeah. But you just keep moving. You just yeah. keep going. And my husband was so sweet. He would make me my breakfast and my lunch and my dinner and 
we would be like, he called himself driving Miss Daisy. Where are we going to go today? You know, just get out and keep moving. And, um, and then I got COVID <laughs> in November. No kidding. <laughs> oh, yeah. How was that? Well, Sharp didn't think it was that cool. I thought it was fine. My husband got it first, so I knew what to do. And I always knew that it was kind of like pneumonia, so treat it like pneumonia. Yep. So his doctor was amazing. He gave me antibiotics because he had walking pneumonia like four years ago. And so he knew how to treat him. And he also had asthma, severe asthma as a child. So when I got it, I knew what to do. But I wanted to be tested to be, so that maybe somehow I would show that I had it and I could get on that flight to go see Trump's inauguration. <laughs> And, you know, I was just trying to think ahead while I had it. I want proof. So then you can't say, I, you know, I need to be vaccinated or something. And I go in at uh, urgent care down in at Sharp and the two little female doctors look at me sitting there and they said, we can't let you drive home. I go, what are you saying? Well, we, you might have blood clots because you had surgery recently. And I said, do I look like I have blood clots? Well, we don't know. So you need to go get a CT scan. I go, you know, I took both these boobs off because I didn't want radiation. And now you're going to inject me with radioactive dye so you can do a CT scan because you think maybe I have blood clots? Yeah. So you have to call one of your daughters to come drive your car home because we can't let you drive and get one of your daughters to take you to emergency at Sharp. So I literally walk in. There's nobody in line. There's nobody in line to yeah. get into emergency. Put me in a room right away. They take a, a chest x-ray from the base of my bed. I don't know how accurate that can be when they point it to you at the base of your bed. It wasn't in a room or like this. And then I, I used I, to do that, you know. Yeah. So, oh, so you used to take it. So they yes. shoot towards you. And yeah. I, how are you aiming so accurately, right? And then uh, That's an art form. It's an art form. And then I was really glad actually I went through all this. Um, and then they said, okay, you know, go in for your CT. So I go in at six, get my chest x-ray. Then I do a CT scan. They inject me. I have my IV, go in. And they said, no, we don't see any blood clots. You just can go home now. Nine o'clock, $15,000 later. And I asked the nurses, you know, they were taken out and ripping off their gowns and throwing them into the trash. So I saw that right away that they were not putting it in hazmat. You yeah. know, if it was hazmat and it was really, really, really dangerous, they would be putting it in a hazmat container. Yeah. But it was just a general trash bag. And they said to me, we know that all you have to do is wash your hands every time you come in and out of here. We're not afraid. I said, wow, this yeah. is worth the visit just to hear you say that. Right. October 2020, November 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Bad part, I didn't get to taste my Thanksgiving dinner, but I learned a lot from being in the hospital at the time. And they were not upset. Everyone looked happy-go-lucky going there. I said, how are you guys doing? They go, we're fine. We know we're doing good. Yeah, because they're making it seem like the, the hospitals are shutting down. Right, they're, they're overcrowded. Overcrowded. Yeah, it's a- it was November 2020. All I can tell is from my perspective what I saw. I don't know what other people see in other times, yeah. but this is what I was in November 2020 after, around Thanksgiving. was the week of Thanksgiving that yeah. I went in. So we recovered. We learned that if you walked, I walked to the mailbox and was mailing a letter and I was breathing hard and I walked back home and took a breath, got home and I go, wow, I feel so good. I grabbed my husband, come out here and put up the Christmas lights. I go, I don't know how I feel. I go, doesn't matter. Just do what you can. He was out there for four hours putting up Christmas lights. Oh boy. And then the next day he was out there for five hours. And the next day, both of us were back at work with no symptoms. Clear. Clear. Yep. We were both not coughing. We were totally feeling good. Yeah. So if you ever get COVID, I always tell people, get antibiotics. Um, we had a really great cough tablet called benzonitate that really rests your persistent coughs. And then go walk your lungs. If you have pneumonia, don't let it atrophy. Walk your lungs and expirate. Breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in. Yeah, breathe. And get vitamin D3 in the sunshine. Yeah. But that's what they do. They have you hole up in your room, dark, right. not exposed to sunshine. You're atrophying. You're not breathing hard because you're just sitting there like a bump on a log watching whatever soap operas you never saw before. <laughs> and that's why people tend to, they waited too long. They wait like four or five days and we attack things like from the first day. Yeah, right, immediately. immediately. Uh-huh. <clears throat> but that, so that was my little COVID thing for all you guys because, you know, I'm not afraid of, of being sick. And so are you still working at the store? Oh, yeah. Really? So we all have our individual jobs. I take my my oldest daughter is, you know, really amazing. Our social media marketing, we have a huge Instagram presence. We're heading towards 12,000 followers. Wow. Amazing. She's an amazing photographer, amazing marketer. Um, our second daughter, she's there. They, and my son-in-law, they're the salespeople of our store. We learned that 
people like buying from our children. We had past employees that were sales and they said, you're not a Collins. Mm. Oh, so wow. we learned that over the many, many years. Yeah. So, our, so give me your, give me some uh, things that you've learned like along the way here with the business. What, what has the business taught you? Well, one of the things is you need to have an element of risk taking. My husband was, is a total risk taker. I, I I admire that so much because again, generationally, my dad was not a risk taker, but yet he yeah. gambled in stocks, uh-huh. with, and then he had an ulcer from that. He made us read the stock market every day from that. Did yeah, from the Los Angeles Times or Herald Examiner. We it was our job to read what his stock did or did not do that day. So, Daddy, why, 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 why? This is a long-term holding thing. Why are you doing this to yourself? A long-term holding thing. And so then he would sell down and then moan about how it went up after he sold it, you know? Stock is not for the weakest stomach, you know? You just got to let it go. You're going to lose. You got to be money that you're not going to count on, right? Correct. But he tried to dabble in my dad had severe peptic ulcers. My, all my parents and my grandmother all drank Mylanta. Are you serious? Yep. And so when my mom, uh, you know, looking at that, those health issues of diabetes wow. and um, heart, high blood pressure, I vowed very early on that I would not look like my parents. So I don't. I do yoga every single morning, no matter whether I'm in China or here uh, on vacation. I have a folded yoga mat in my suitcase all the time. And I've been doing yoga for easily 20 years. I was doing a jazzercise before that at six in the morning. And I don't go work out at gyms anymore. I just do my yoga every single morning and I park at the farthest parking space I can find and walk. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and so those are, my parents both were very poor health. They ate very, very badly. Very Your badly. Your parents? Yes. High processed foods, high sodium, high fat. It was very rough. I, I hated seeing what happened. And then my mom herniated her disc moving around. She went back and became a kindergarten teacher. And she was part of Los Angeles Unified Lottery. And she and it was year round. They were overcrowded. So they were constantly um, changing classrooms um, for the kids because they were into year round teaching. So that, con- that, you know, one teacher would be teaching this session and then the next teacher will teach. And they have to move their supplies and their materials. And my mom her- um, herniated her disc and she was disabled for the rest of her life. Oh, no way. Yeah, she was bedridden. Wow. What mm-hmm. age did that happen? 49. No kidding. Mm-hmm. Oh my god. It was gosh. awful. My mom lived like a vegetable uh, towards the very end. I always thought she looked kind of like Jabba the Hutt. She was so atrophied and so just dis- <sighs> couldn't move. You know, nothing's worse. So you have to go and, you know, your dignity, someone has to take you to the bathroom because yeah. you can't get up on the toilet and wipe you and all that. And I just vowed I'm not going to be like that. I look nothing like how my mom not, I mean, I look nothing yeah. like how my mom and dad did. And even for my dad, um, you know, he was, he, I think that's an over-medicated generation. Yeah. My dad and my mom had huge amounts of drugs that they took. One to offset the results of one that did gave this result. And it was just crazy. And these were just prescribed by doctors. Yeah, all the time. And then they put you on antidepressants, yep. which makes you suicidal. Right. Let's talk about that. My dad said, oh, I just take one more pill and then I don't have to wake up. I go, daddy, what are you taking that's making you talk like that? So, you know, mental health is 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 perpetuated by an over medicated society. And they just quickly send you off into these spirals that maybe wouldn't have had if you just told them, get some fresh air, walk, um, you know, eat vegetables, drink water, don't drink soda, you know, and just all kinds of things that are holistically. Yes better and super inexpensive but we know pharma makes a ton of money off of our generation tons and they trusted them they trusted our parents to trust them and they got over medicated and they died as a result of whatever they were given believe me they i know everyone i know said that their parents were over medicated they have their whole little little medicine distributor with every single one of them yeah where they have what medication to take for that day at what time oh don't let me forget i have to eat this you know i traveled i took my dad to china because i said daddy you work so hard let me take you places let's go because my dad could not spend the money to travel yeah he could not bring himself to buy anything. He could not bring himself to pay for anything. So I said, Daddy, I'll pay for you. Let's go. I'll take you in the wheelchair. I'll get you to the airport. If you can't walk, I'll get the wheelchair for you. And so we traveled. And one of the first things we did is we went to the embassy suites in um, South San Francisco where we have some family and friends from China. And he 
couldn't believe we were getting a free breakfast at Embassy Suites. And I go, Daddy, it's not free. It's part of the hotel fee. But enjoy it. Yeah. You know, take as much as you want. You want eggs, but don't waste the food. Okay, Daddy? Just take what you want and eat what you want. And we, there's always more. Oh, this is so good. I go, Daddy, yeah. this, this uh, is what you were missing. That life is meant to be lived. You work so hard, Daddy. You know what? And I want to tell you, I appreciate everything you did. And maybe my brothers and sisters may not say that to you, but I want to tell you, and I said it at his obit- at, at his um, eulogy for his funeral. I said, Daddy was not the perfect dad, but he did his best to be a good dad, that we were never hungry. That was his biggest thing. You're never hungry, right? You're never hungry. I go, no, Daddy, we were never hungry. Yeah, because I was hungry when I was little. And then his dad was never in his life. He was never in his life. Which, and there you go. There's the, the generational thing. Yeah. And that's why I appreciate our church when they talk about the father. Yes. The fatherless society. If you don't have a strong dad, I was lucky. My husband's dad was amazing. He adored me. His dad adored me. Yeah. Um, so I knew by, I just knew when I met his dad that he was going to be a good dad because he had such a great dad that I loved so much. Um, so, you know, there's no perfect parent. But if you can try your best to try to change who you are for your kids, is that enough? I hope. But even my siblings sometimes did not feel that was enough. And I cried. I cried and cried. I cried with my dad. I cried after my dad passed away. I cried sometimes still. And I think how unfair that this this young man came from China and no one appreciated what he did that said, I'm proud of you. So that was one of the things. My dad and my mom never told me they were proud of me. I was, wow. is that kind of yeah. selfish? I don't know. Do all our self-esteems need it? Yes. Yeah, to a degree. Did you? I would did, say. Did your parents tell you you were handsome? Uh, my mom did. Yes. So my, my dad was completely uh, um, non-existent. Exactly. Literally. The That's opposite. a generational thing. And I, the, like you said, the number one thing that my goal was to be the most amazing hands-on dad because I was going to break that cycle. Yes. yes. Every, you know, as, as many games, I mean, almost every single game, pra- even practice, you know, so. That's right. Like you talked about breaking the cycle. I was, that's what motivated me when having, that's why I want another one because exactly. I, know, cause I know that Rachel and I have created this amazing dynamic and bond between our family. And I think that's probably maybe subconsciously was maybe what a, we had these two great daughters that we loved and we just, you know, I, and when we got married, I really didn't want five kids. And actually someone told me that five, you know, it's a naturally occurring number. Yeah. Five stars have five fingers are five toes are five. And so even though I wanted a six one, people would go and say, oh, five girls, same as one boy. What? Yeah. <laughs> I went to my mom. Mommy, did you have you ever heard of this? Where five girls is equivalent to one son? And they go, no. My mom, you know, my, yeah. my ultimately un-Chinese parents. And, uh, but people told us uh, different cultures, you know, Chinese, Vietnamese, Filipino. No, maybe not Filipino, but Vietnamese had told us that five is a lucky number. So we stopped at five taught children. And people are amazed when they come into our store. How did you get your kids to be like this? Because it doesn't start now. It started from the beginning. We spent time with our kids that our parents didn't spend time okay they were working yeah they were working and my mom was taking care of a handicapped child very severely handicapped child right very difficult but i said still so you take yourself not don't talk about your parents just what can you do to yourself how can you be the best example live by example be the parent Maybe they aren't the way that you like them to be right now, but we hope by living by example that ultimately subconsciously they will become that. They will live by that. And it is common where say, you're Mrs. Collins. Let me congratulate you. Your daughter is amazing. I love working with her. What the ultimate compliment. That's it. And I tell them the in front of my children, I am so proud of my daughter. Because my mom never told me she loved me and she never told me she was proud of me, my parents. And it is old school. Yes. Chinese people say, I'll never forget it. My oldest daughter, she's so pretty. When she was little and we were at my mom's house, I go, Brianna, you're so beautiful. And she said, don't say that. Don't say that. She'll be vain. I go, no, she's going to have a good self-esteem and know that she is beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That was your mom saying that. She don't told say- Yeah. Don't talk. Don't tell her. Don't tell her. Don't talk like that. I go, why? Wow. 
Why? That's why I, when my husband say, oh, you're so beautiful. I would say, no, I'm not. I would say, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I don't know. I'm sure there's other girls that feel the same way where they say, no, I'm not beautiful. No, I'm not handsome. You know, a guy will say, I'm not handsome. No one's ever told me I was handsome. I'm not good looking. I'm scrawny. I've got pimples on my face or, you know, um, just whatever reason that you don't think you don't have the perfect blonde hair that looks like Farrah Fawcett, right? I could never get my hair to flip like that girl. There's no way my hair was too thick yeah. and straight. So you, you start getting perms, trying to make it so that you can at least get your hair to do something. You know, you just live through those. And why do you think I mean, a lot of people color their hair? They're not happy with the hair color. Right. And that's okay. You can change it if you want. It makes you feel happy. And the most important is, do you have good self-esteem? Yeah. My yeah. husband has his patience and his self-esteem are what attracted me to him and his eyes. And his eyes. <laughs> um, so, you know. Self-esteem is everything. Yeah, to talk to a man that has good self-esteem is so attractive. It's so attractive. Yeah. And same thing with a woman. You're talking to a woman who's self-deprecating. Oh, I'm ugly or I'm fat today or, you know, I look ugly today. I'm having a bad hair day or whatever. They're self-deprecating all the time. Yeah, all the time. It's not attractive. No. Who wants to talk to someone talking about bad about themselves? Yeah. And then if they start talking to their kids that way, say, well, you're fat and you're ugly and you're never going to be anything good or you're lazy. I mean, my grandmother used to say that you're a horrible cook. You can't cook rice. Well, that's why God made rice cookers. <laughs> I mean, when they made rice cookers, it wasn't that long ago that we came up with rice cookers in the early 80s or whatever. I had to boil rice and watch for the boil to stop and then turn down the heat. And if I didn't turn it down right at the right time, it all turned burnt. <laughs> So they just told me I couldn't cook. And so to this day, I think yeah. I can't cook, you know. And, and Actually, I'm really good with a microwave and a, and a crock Yeah, the pot. rice cooker I can handle. Exactly. But barely. But barely. Put it in, put the water in, turn the knob, call it a day. Um, and thank you. Thank God for Keurigs. Exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because I made my husband, when we first got married, I made him a cup of coffee. And I thought you, it was Sanka because that's what my grandmother drank. So I just put water with the coffee grounds and gave it to him and he about died. <laughs> um, so, and I love what you said about setting the example for your children Yeah. because at the end of the day, children, they're not going to really listen to what we're saying. Mm -hmm. They don't care. They're going to block it out. Mm -hmm. So the best chance that we have of, of raising great children or is, is by actually setting the example as great human beings, a loving couple with mm -hmm. your significant other, your spouse, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is so few are doing that. They're setting the bad example right. of no affection, no love, no respect, right. no self-esteem. Right. So let's finish with this, Cynthia. Let's let's land the plane here. Give me give me give me some pearls to end this for the viewers and watchers and listeners. Of you know, you're 63. You're extremely optimistic. What has what has guided you along the way to be such a? How what has guided you? What, what are we going to attribute to guide you to be such a? beautiful person that has broken the 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 what you call like a the generational curse so to speak of mm -hmm. no affection nothing like that what has guided you and what can you give our viewers and listeners it's here? interesting you say pearl because when i i earned a chinese scholarship i had to have a chinese name i didn't have a chinese name and my dad <laughs> named me precious pearl oh really mm -hmm. oh. yeah so that's really cool i come from a huge gratitude gives you attitude there we go Gratitude gives you altitude. I am beyond grateful for where I am today. I cry out of sheer gratitude to God that he was always there watching over me. I'm blessed to have an immense amount of faith, but sometimes I'd get my mm. faith tested and I cry about that because I said, how can I, how can I question the God that's been there since I was in Compton, right? I, I, I even tell people, you know, Aren't you grateful? Are you grateful? Are you grateful? Are you grateful? I yeah. mean, what are you grateful for? Come on, let's list all the things. And there's a um, there's a song. We just came back from watching Elevation Worship in Pennsylvania and Massachusetts, and they had a song about what you're grateful for. Multitudes of multitudes. And it was like, it went on and on and on and on, and it was scrolling through all these things. I can list so many things I'm grateful for. And one of the things I say, give things away for free. And that's your smile. Yes. Can you not smile? That's why when I flew three weeks ago, on the first day that no masks were mandated on the airlines. Wow. In the airport. I would tell the, 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 all the stewardesses and TSA, oh, I love your smile. 
I love your smile. And they would smile back because we couldn't see their smile. I know. For two and a half years, we couldn't see anybody's smiles. And even the children, you couldn't see their smile. Smile. The one thing I I think is a ready smile is a free gift to give to anyone. And if they're having a bad day, go, oh my gosh, I love what you're wearing. Tell them, I love your hair. Yeah. Or I love your eyes, or I love, thank you. And you just see them like straighten up their shoulders a little yeah. bit. And they said, oh, yeah, I, I do look good, you know. Uh, you don't know what kind of day they had or what uh, what they came to work with or who their parents were and what their negative self-talk is. But can you, you'll never, you'll intersect with that person for one second of their life. You'll never see that person again. Never. You'll just cross paths once. Can you just say one great thing? Thank you for being here. I go to UPS and FedEx. Thank you for being here. You guys are the best. Um, You just have to say something, anything, and you will get back that smile. You know, I go downtown and I pray over homeless people. It's like, okay, which of you want a prayer? Oh, I'm good. I'm good. How can you be good? You're living here on the street. Do you want to be here when you're 63 years old? Let's get to this. Come on. They say, no, they don't want to be here when they're 63. Are you grateful that maybe someone spoke into you you'll never see again? And I had teachers all along the way. I had neighbors all along the way that knew I I had potential, but they knew I was in dark spots. So if you guys say, if you've ever been through depression, I think all of us have been through depression in one level or another. Who helped you get out of that depression? Who helped you get out? What did they say? What did they do with you? They spent time with you. They listened. Yes. They listened to you. And then they had a positive word. You're so good at what you do. You're such a good athlete. I like what you're wearing today. Oh, I love that color on you. You know, those are things that I wish my mom and dad had said to me. So take it and flip it around. Yeah. Give it back out. Just because it didn't happen to you doesn't mean it has to not happen to the rest of the world and your children. That's right. So... And I buy, I buy things for my kids and my grandkids all the time. I'm always thinking of whatever. They look really cute in this thing or whatever. And it's such a joy. I mean, my husband is the most generous man in the world. He will buy anyone anything. And we did it while we were in Philadelphia. It's the first time we bought a concert ticket for the waiter. He wow. had a breakthrough. He wow. was in jail. He had, it was a hotel where the hotel owner came to our table. How do, I've never met a hotel owner before. He came directly to my table. I go, oh, are you here for a conference? He goes, no, I'm the owner of this hotel. What? He's a second chancer. He hired everyone wow. without resumes. They were on drugs. They had no resume. They had no reference. They were not working. He built the hotel on needle, drug needles and, uh, and barbed wire. He built this place and he gave everyone a second chance. And this boy had a second chance. He was in jail. He was in drugs. He was on the, on the streets. He was living in a car and now he saw Jesus. He got saved. You need to come to this concert. And so that's what you start doing. And this is the church that believes in that. Go take someone out to lunch. Go take someone, buy someone a ticket, go buy something. Do something generous. That you never would have done before. For someone uh, a selfless act, be a beacon of light to everyone around you. Tip generously. Oh, I'm the, I preach that 24-7 Tip generously. My ridiculously. Husband, he, my husband is the king. So yes. my, bottom, my bottom line, the one thing I learned is we learned to tithe at this church. Yep. And I was so uncomfortable with that. Yeah. What? You want me to give away what? Every week? And then in July of last year or June when we were doing our vision builders, you want me to give more money from our store? Well, we dedicated our store to God last June when we did Vision Builders. And our store exploded. 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 In 43 years, you never, wow. never saw what we saw in in growth in our store for the holidays and after the holidays, right now, January, February, we've and my daughter had her baby in January, so we were missing my oldest daughter and my son-in-law. They stayed home for a month with the baby, and we were missing, and we were on a skeleton crew, and we still did it. We still killed it, but now that she's been back, we're killing it like crazy, wow. and it is, we tell them we do this. At first, they were uncomfortable because Bill goes, oh, don't tell them what we're doing. Why not? Yeah. Tell them we give them 10% of our income to the church. Tell them that we are we committed our business to God. Because from all this, it was all God's to begin with. Yeah, it's all coming back. But we didn't know that until we came to this church. 
Awakened Church, we came in October 2020, and our lives, the trajectory of our lives from Awakened Church, from our pastors, from Pastor Jurgen and Leanne, from Pastor John and Becky, from all the other pastors in our campus and all the other campuses, because of them, we now know we can get old and we're going to be spiritually full going towards heaven. And that's such a comforting feeling because people don't want to die. That's what COVID's all about. They don't want to die. Right. Well, it, it's uh, it, you and I, we got uh, there at the exact same time, I October, know. November of 20. We're having almost the same journey. Yes. By the way, I'll be with Jurgen and Leanne tonight because mm -hmm. they're at the All In Pathfinder event. I'm mm -hmm. going to be with them tonight. My mm -hmm. guy, I love this guy. Yeah. And what they've done in our trajectory of our life, our business, it's why I did, that's why I started this podcast. Yeah. It was Awaken Church. Yeah. Because Pathfinders gave me the, Finally, the, the courage to do this. To the courage and to know your potential. And belief, yes. To, I mean, to, to encourage me to step into my calling. And, I mean, I'm going to apply for Pathfinders, and I'm not comfortable, believe me, I'm not. Are you applying this one? Yes. When you, yes, for this session, the new session. Did you already apply? No. I it, was there last night, and I'm sending out applications. No, I'm, I know. I'm giving you one I, after this. The reason why, this is weird, is because I've been self-employed because I've had my real estate license. I still have it, actually. I've never really had to do a resume, and I felt I don't know how to do a resume. And okay, that's well, that's it. I'm <laughs> sending you the application. <laughs> Cynthia, this was amazing. You rock. I love you. You're the sweetest little thing with your little bandana there. I got to meet the rest of your kids. Mm -hmm. I've met Bill at church, right? Right? I met him one time? Yep. Three of okay. our daughters were at, at church this past Monday on uh, okay. Sunday. Promotion. I got to meet him. So, yeah. And I'm coming by the store. Mm -hmm. We're, we're close Sundays and Mondays for church and family. Yay. Yeah. We're close Sunday. Yeah. Um, we got to connect further. I'm so mm -hmm. excited about this. I'm mm -hmm. so excited we ran into each other. It was at, it was, at uh, was it Hero? Yes. Yeah. And you're like, I got to get in there. You yeah. got to bring me in. It's okay. You're yeah. coming in. Yes. So Cynthia Collins, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, Real Deal Talk. This yeah. was fantastic. Yeah. I love you. Nice job. Thank you for sharing your testimony. Now we're going to connect further and you're going to apply for Pathfinders. Yeah, I think I am. That's a wrap, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Peace.